Good evening. This is the meeting of the Northampton Charter Review Committee. We're here in the City Council Chambers tonight. Our first order of business is to approve the minutes of our last meeting, June 4th, which um, you all should have received. Um, I'm sorry, point of order. I think we should probably be roll call first. Uh, you want to have a roll call? Okay. Annie? Stan Moulton. Present. Robbie Sullivan. Here. Dylan Gaffney. Here. Sam Hopper. Here. Bob Bullrice. Here. Patty Healy. Here. Molly Fox. Here. Lynn Simmons. Here. Councilor Dwight. Here. Okay, everyone is present except for Dylan Gaffney. I, uh, I move approval of the minutes of June 4th. Second. Any uh, suggested changes, additions? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Those are approved unanimously. All right, now is a time for public comment. Um, if anyone in the audience wants to address us about, well, about anything, but, but if you're here to address us about the, uh, the question of appointed versus elected city clerk, um, that is coming up soon on the agenda. Um, I know the mayor is here to talk about a couple of uh, amendments that have, have been proposed by his office. And Bill Scher is here to talk with us in a, in a minute. So uh, anybody else have anything they want to say during public comment? Okay. Uh, any updates from committee members about things that are not on tonight's agenda? Okay, then we'll uh, we'll ask Bill to Bill Share to come to the podium, and uh, as um, as I think all of you know, Bill was part of the last review of the charter in 2011-12. I was on the charter drafting committee. Okay. I was not on the charter review committee. Okay, you were on the drafting <laughs> committee in 2011. Is that right? Is that right? Sounds right. Okay. All the years blur together. Um, and I appreciate your being here tonight, Bill. And, and we, we asked you to come um, simply to give us a, a bit of an overview about issues that you remember being important during the drafting of the last charter and uh, anything that you think we should be thinking about and then perhaps we'll have some questions for you. Sure, um, I won't, uh, I'll try not to go on for, for too long. Um, but as I mentioned, the, the charter review process preceded the charter drafting committee. There was a charter review group recommended that the whole document needed an overhaul. It, 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 it was, you know, 19th century, highly archaic. Uh, and uh, our job was to actually do the writing of the new charter, and we were greatly aided by a consultant um, out of a, an operation affiliated with UMass Boston, if memory serves. And this guy just goes from town to town fixing charters in Massachusetts, so he, he had a template that we worked off of, and he basically said, here are the placeholders in that template where you have to make your, your, your judgments and your political decisions for how you want to do it for yourself, but this is how you clean up an old charter. Uh, and the, the biggest uh, sort of philosophical uh, task that we had was uh, the question of balancing uh, executive power and legislative power uh, at the time, uh, the mayor was uh, was running the council meetings. The mayor held the gavel. Uh, the city council president did not. Uh, and so there was a sentiment in the community. I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a majority sentiment. I can't know. We don't, we don't have polls. But s some people showed up and felt that the council was under the mayor's thumb and needed to be more of an independent voice. And on the other side, we had people that felt uh, the, uh, the two-year mayoral term was outdated, that the, that was from a time when the mayor was more of a you know, quasi-volunteer position. Uh, it clearly was much more of a professional full-time position. It's being paid as such. And it should have a four-year term so the mayor could uh, take the longer view on matters. Uh, and so we took both recommendations to heart uh, and recommended extending the mayoral term and taking the mayor off of 
the council, uh, creating, uh, so giving the, the gavel to the city council president and creating a vice president for when the city council president is not um, president at meetings. Uh, and uh, I would argue that arrangement has worked as intended. I think the council, I mean, even though that change is arguably symbolic or cosmetic, I think it has changed the, the, the social dynamic between the council and the mayor. Um, you know, one of the more uh, 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 complex examples of that is the was the camera debate, the security camera debate, uh, and whether you liked or disliked the outcome or found the process to be an exciting display of democracy or an unpleasant display of uh, <laughs> friction. Um, I think that that is the kind of relationship that you're going to get when you have a clearer separation of powers. There's going to be some actual back and forth between the council and the mayor. And I would argue, again, irregardless of what you think of the result, it didn't result in a breakdown of communications. The council and the mayor still work together. There still was collaboration and negotiation, even if it was more, uh, relatively speaking, contentious than some other episodes of, of the past. Um, so I think we, I think I personally think we struck the right balance with that, and um, I don't see a need. I personally speak for myself only. I can't speak for the whole previous committee. Um, uh, I don't think you want to do anything more to upset that balance. And, and you know, the separation of powers was blurry when the mayor was on the council. I don't think you want to re-blur it by either going back to that or going the other direction and having the legislative branch encroach into executive branch uh, responsibilities. Um, on a couple of other matters uh, that are sort of less uh, big picture, uh, we did have a very uh, robust discussion of the city clerk question. Um, the consultant that we had noted to us that the trend in the state was to make those types of positions appointed and not elected, that they were positions of technical expertise and didn't require uh, being democratically sanctioned uh, by, the, by the public. Uh, Northampton has done that for several other types of positions like treasurer. Clerk was kind of the last one that we haven't done that with. Um, uh, there was a strong view on the other side of that question that was articulated uh, at one of the forums that we had. Um, and even though the, the chair of our committee made it very clear to us that he, he did not want us making recommendations based on politics. He did not want, he wanted us to make recommendations based on what we thought was the, the best recommendation for the city. Um, I can speak for myself and say I was certainly spooked at the, we were trying to do the whole charter. And if people didn't like one thing in our recommendation and it went up to a referendum, the whole thing would go down. So we didn't have the luxury of doing it a la carte. Uh, and even though I was instructed by my chair to not think this way, <laughs> I was definitely worried about doing something that was gonna cause the whole thing to, to, to go down. Um, even though my, my personal sympathy was to make it an appointed position. Uh, I think you have the luxury at least to not have to worry about uh, sinking an entire reform package in addressing that question, though of course you should make your own independent judgment. Uh, and somewhere along the same lines, we did talk about uh, ranked choice voting and other election reforms that also uh, was a fairly, got a fairly heated, we had a fairly heated discussion about that. Um, and you know, we, we didn't have the luxury to get deep into it, I think the way you have, have already. Uh, and so we were reluctant to uh, make a big change in the, our election structure without having a fuller uh, discussion with the community. Um, uh, so uh, we, you know, we, didn't, we didn't take the step and put it into our, our recommendation. We did recommend having a separate committee to meet independently talk about ranked choice voting, which I don't think happened, but you've, you're doing it here, and so it kind of fulfills the recommendation uh, in spirit. Um, and while I wouldn't tell you uh, one way or the other which way to, way to go with that, uh, I would uh, make the general point, and I, and I think this has been made in some of your past discussions already, whether it's about ranked choice voting or otherwise, uh, you don't have to look to the charter to right every wrong in society or the city. Um, you know, the charter is only meant to 
uh, be a foundation for governance and there's so many ways that uh, elections in the world could, uh, could work better or this could work better, that could work better and a charter just can't fix everything. I mean, you know, one example, you know, I think we talked about and you might have talked about it previously is how do we get a more, a better representation on the council? How can it be more diverse? How can it be less white or more diverse socioeconomically or people from different walks of life? You know, it's harder to be on the council if you're always meeting at night and, you're, and, you, and you work a night shift. Uh, and that's just the kind of thing that the charter can't fix. Uh, that requires a degree of organizing in the public uh, to uh, find that candidate and build a um, grassroots network to get, get that person on the council and no matter how much you want to make a procedural fix to try to uh, uh, facilitate it. And you know, there's certain things you know, that, we, that we talked about. You know, we had a whole debate about compensation that was also very, very fraught. Uh, and some people said well, they should be paid a whole lot more to make it easier for people who don't have a lot of money or aren't retirees to be on the council. And other folks saying that this shouldn't be a cash cow, that you should do it out of a pure need for service and not have it be a salary position. And so we ended up uh, you know, creating an independent commission that recommends uh, pay packages that the council then votes uh, up or down uh, and, and not going in one direction or the other in, in that debate. Um, so there, there's, there's limits on what the charter is going to be able to do to um, solve those sorts of problems. And you, you shouldn't feel obligated to try to solve every single last problem. Um, try to solve the problems that a charter is designed to solve and leave the rest to uh, the democratic process. Uh, so that is um, my general overview of, I think, how our discussions went and what our conclusions were, and I'm happy to answer any further questions you guys have. Thank you, Bill. Questions? Sam? Um, can you talk some more about any discussion you had on term limits? We had it. Um, I don't uh, you know, if, if you're, I'm going on memory. I didn't go back and read all the minutes and watch all, all the videos all over again. I don't recall anyone making a really strong pro-term limits argument. Uh, I mean, it, it might have come up, you know, someone might have said something at a, at a, you know, we had a bunch of forums, it wasn't just us. Uh, we had at least one forum that was actually fairly well attended, <coughs> the ones that were more sparsely attended. Um, so someone might have said something in favor of term limits at one point, but it, it, it certainly wasn't something that there was a huge groundswell, please do term limits. And the general feeling of the committee um, and mind you, we also talked about recall. Um, should there be a mayoral recall? Uh, and our general view on all those questions was, uh, we have elections every two years, even though, you're even though we're gonna lengthen the mayoral term, there's still elections every two years. Uh, if people don't like the way things are going, they can vote people out. Um, we don't have to uh, prematurely kick somebody off if they're doing good work and people think they're doing good work. Uh, and just speaking for my, myself, you know, this is the kind of situation where I would say, you know, you know, is there an actual problem in Northampton Hill that, here that we have to solve? I mean, generally speaking, we have a hard time finding people to run for these positions. <laughs> you have people have to like go beat the bushes and like find I me. Mean, at this point, I, I don't think we even have a ward four candidate for school committee right now. Um, so it's not like there's a whole bunch of people who are dying to get on and are being blocked by this massive incumbent power. Uh, and, th and this is the case with municipal governments across the country. It's, it's not the kind of thing, it's, it's not glamorous work, and it's not attracting a ton of people. Um, so what does term limits give you? Um, if you're gonna force somebody out who's actually doing the work, and there isn't a long line of people trying to get in, what is it getting you? Other questions? Uh, Bill, I wanted to uh, have you elaborate a bit on the, 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 the issue of whether the charter can effectively uh, provide incentives to increase diversity uh, among elected officials. And you talked about compensation. Did, did the idea of some kind of a sliding scale of compensation uh, ever surface uh, during your, your work? It may have. That compensation debate was it's really painful. Um, so I, I don't remember exactly what you talked about that in particular. Uh, I think it's the kind of thing that, again, I don't know if you have to do it in the charter. 
we, we created this independent committee that meets every certain number of years. Uh, they could recommend that and the city council could then approve it on their own accord. Um, so you don't have to make that fixed in the charter. Um, and I don't think this thing, I think it's a bad idea. I mean, I'm, I was certainly on the side of how, however much money you can pay these people, you should pay them. I mean, that's sort of my general bent. Um, so if a sliding scale was gonna help people get paid more money, I would be all for it. Um, but it is a very contentious question. Uh, there are people in the community who, are going to, who will say very strenuously to go in the other direction. Uh, and uh, something like that strikes me as better suited for uh, broader public debate on a uh, not quite year to year, but every few years basis so the public can decide what we think uh, the council is worth. And if, if, if you recall, um, the, f the first act of the commission that we created was controversial because uh, uh, they recommended, um, uh, and Bill, you can maybe articulate this better than I can, but essentially it was, was going to downgrade the, the insurance you guys got. <coughs> um, and the council looked at the recommendation and, we, and said, we don't think this is a fair recommendation, and so they didn't approve it. Uh, and so it was somewhat controversial that they went against the committee's recommendation, but uh, and there was one person on our drafting committee who was also on that committee who he felt very strongly that the council shouldn't really get a say, that the council, sh that, that, that was, it was an inherent conflict of interest for the council to vote on its own pay packages. Uh, and the bar cons cons consensus of the committee was you, you just can't do anything about that fact. You know, at the end of the day, they got to vote on the budget. It's part of the budget. You can't create some sort of separate body that votes on it. Are you going to, is that going to be an election? Are you going to elect a body just, just to vote on pay packages? That's a fairly extreme solution for that sort of problem. When if the council votes for a pay package the public doesn't like, they can respond their displeasure at the next election if they want to. Um, so uh, my, my bottom line point is, is it's going to be something that's going to stir up a lot of debate. I think you would leave something like that for people to debate in the legislative process. Uh, just to expand on that a little bit, actually the point of the sliding scale, I believe was introduced by me in the course of the debate that Bill described, which was the compensation package, while we were debating the draft charter that was presented to us. So that we, we went, that was for quite a while there were many many meetings where we discussed the charter and 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 looked at it granularly and the compensation package was of course one issue and that's where we i had suggested i mean one of the arguments for retaining the insurance was one also to continue to offer as at least that not being a disqualifier for someone considering running and then also that uh counselors were de facto employees and, and at a time when we were talking about universal health care coverage, remember those days we were just talking about that? Well, that well, the idea was to eliminate coverage as opposed to expanding coverage for, for employees. It didn't seem like the right idea at the right time, at that time. But, so it didn't come up during the course of their discussion of the draft, it came up on the floor because that was a concern, was how do you diversify the committee and the I floated the idea we were trying to research it to see if there's any if, if the state would make an allowance for that so far we've gotten negative responses from the state it's just it's too new what would you do what are the what are the I mean one of the things that you know you have to maintain privacy um, someone's wealth determining someone's wealth and see how they qualify up or down for compensation but I don't think it's, I still don't think it's beyond reach. I think that's, that's something worth investigating. But I don't know, again, to Bill's point, I suppose embedding that as a dimension of the charter, one, would slow it down <laughs> because we do a review every 10 years, uh, the process of it, whereas it would be something better vetted on the floor here uh, in the council. Were underrepresented communities actually engaged in the conversation as you were talking about it? Oh, I doubt it. Um, I mean, uh, we we tried. 
uh, you know, we had public forums. Uh, we even did some uh, like in individual forums. Uh -huh. uh, for I, I, you know, I did um, I did at least one, you know, coffee at the Hate Market. You know, two people came. Um, you know, it's it, it's a chronic problem. Uh, how do you get communities that are not that have not already built politically engaged networks to get engaged? Real sort of chicken and egg. The communities uh, haven't built the engaged political I mean, network. I mean, whether it's the communities haven't done it themselves, or people who are already in the establishment haven't done the outreach, or uh -huh. the outreach has happened. The community hasn't. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm sure there's all sorts of stories of people who have, you know, <laughs> done an attempt and it didn't work out. But at the end of the day, um, there are communities in the city that are not represented in, in the council. Uh -huh. um, and. I just don't think there's a shortcut answer to that problem. Mm. Um, I don't think you're going to, I mean, even if you had the sliding scale, I mean, again, I'd, I'd be for it. I mean, if you could pay them six figure salaries, I'd be for it. Um, I don't know if that would magically get someone who uh, is in a low income household to decide, I want to do this for the next two years. It's a, it's a, it's a big commitment. And it's, many ways not fun <laughs> um, so uh, I think it requires just a lot of groundwork to find whatever individuals have an inkling of interest in this stuff and uh, and navigate them through the process and, and give them the means uh, to be able to participate so I mean, your conversation might be a piece of that puzzle but I doubt it's the entire puzzle. Uh, so again, I, I wouldn't stop you from doing it, but I wouldn't think doing that is going to be a panacea. Because I think there's there's, there's deeper seated problems in how, in how you get uh, impoverished low income communities to be politically engaged. That's just a tough, tough problem. I agree. I think part of the question, though, that's on the table is whether or not to even have a conversation about whether the charter should be should consider this question of compensation and I guess I have a real concern about making that decision on behalf of mm -hmm. underrepresented communities without including underrepresented communities mm -hmm. so I'm not sure why we're having that conversation on some level well the uh, a, a, I don't know if that was a rhetorical question so I don't a know. bit <laughs> a bit I mean, the 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 fact is, is there's been a long, long time where we haven't had that conversation. Mm. Um, it's a step closer. Yeah. It's not an achievement by any stretch, mm. and, it, and it's not an end. And it is what Bill refers to as true. There is this ongoing frustration. It's not, and it's, and it's actually not only uh, communities of need. Um, by and large is we discovered actually through some testimony uh, the last meeting there was some testimony about we don't we don't know what's going on you're not telling us we're not in, we don't know about what's happening in the community and the, there is a question of how do you engage a community usually the way the community gets engaged is when there's an, a direct affront or something that that, that that really bothers them some kind of a Exactly, and it's something that directly affects the person who comes to speak to that, mm -hmm. and usually speaks that they they have not been informed or there hasn't been any um, public discussion about it, and so on. One point of fact, those things have occurred, but it it's the, I mean, we, my entire time in politics in Northampton, and and it's not exclusive to Northampton, is the 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 frustration with engagement. We're doing right now. We're doing budget hearings. Um, and you would imagine that there's a lot of people concerned about issues around the budget. And we, our last budget hearing actually was the best attended one I've ever seen. And, and I mean, for instance, tonight, you look out here in the audience, and all the people who are here are people we invited to speak. Mm. <laughs> and so the, I had, and I don't, and I don't know how you put it in the charter, how we do it. The, I think the critical point is outreach. We certainly fail on that score. Um, but once you do the outreach, what is it that inspires people to come and participate beyond that, too? Mm -hmm. And that has done, I mean, we have done that. We have done uh, 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 
voter registration drives in various communities are under, underrepresented in the um, uh, multilingual uh, uh, flyers and uh, translators and things like that. And you can understand if you think about it, if you're feeling somewhat outside of a community and someone's coming to invite you in, there's this automatic suspicion that comes with that and everything else. So it is, and again, I don't know what you put in a charter to even come close to trying to approximate a fix to that. And I think Bill's point, that's something we work on the ground um, tr and try and figure out how we crack that nut. If it's crackable, I don't know. And just for clarification purposes, what is it specifically that we are trying to fix? The lack of representation or the lack of, or uh, in, in, for that matter, there are voices that uh, in the community and priorities in the community that we do not know. So we're talking about equity. I assume people being represented on the council, people being represented on you know citizen advisory committees and things the like charter that. Charter review committee, or, right? All, all that kind of stuff. I mean, I got on the charge drafting committee because there was a, uh, I think a notice in the paper saying you know contact your council if you want to go on. I emailed one other guy emailed. She, the, my council chose between two of us, and that was it. You know, there there, there weren't twenty people that wanted to do it, um, and. There's, you know, this is actually a very unusual year on the council that there's going to be so much turnover. Um, but uh, you still don't have, um, you, you only have one, you have one contested race with an incumbent and one contested race that's open. And the other open seats at this point are not contested. Um, it's not because there's some sort of giant cabal like freezing people out. Just no one has pulled out the papers to do it. Um, so. Uh, so you, you can make all the changes in the world with the charter. S someone either has to step up on their own accord or someone has to uh, come in from the outside of the community and say, look, if you if you guys want this, this is how you do it. And I'm happy to help you do that. I mean, it's going to be five people or 10 people, 15 people. It's got to be sustained. Uh, it it can't, can't just be a response to a single crisis. It has to be saying, do you want to be involved in the inner workings of the city government in a uh, ongoing way? Um, and I cannot be a spokesperson for an impoverished family in any stretch. My guess is it's not top of mind when you're trying to, you know, live paycheck to paycheck. Um, so solving that problem, I think, is an enormous problem. I don't think it's something that should be um, sloughed off as unsolvable, but it's not something that's going to be solved uh, with a single line in a charter. It's, it's going to require sustained community involvement. Why can't it be both and? Oh, it can. I mean, I'm not saying don't do. I'm not saying don't try to do something about it. Um, I would be very careful in assuming. Again, you, you should have the engagement as much as possible. Uh, you, you might hear, yeah, it's not really about the salary. That's not the problem. Uh, my problem is X, Y, Z. I, I, I don't know what you might hear. Well, that's um, just it. Yeah. That we don't have. We don't have the data. Yeah. And it's not disaggregated, and that's piece A. Yeah. Um, and now we're sort of making decisions on behalf of a lot of information we don't know. Yeah. But the one piece that we are referring to within the charter is the structural piece, and that's not something we want to necessarily just sweep under the rug right away. Yeah. Um, the engagement piece is piece one, and then how can we make this more equitable, people uh, be able to participate um, and make that more equitable on a structural level? Well, then the charter, you know, the charter does become um, a really interesting discussion point. Right. Because it's not necessarily just, well, whoever is interested can just step up to the plate as if everybody is coming up with equal resources. We simply know that's not true. There's another debate to be had about, you know, you know, not having term limits, et cetera, so that people can gain experience and all of this, that, and the other. There's definitely a discussion to be had around equity and term limits, for sure. So I wouldn't be comfortable taking that off the table until we are actually engaging and having those meaningful discussions with the people who are actually impacted by them. I mean, the one thing I could suggest, and I, I don't, I don't, I, don't you know, I recall us trying to fan out and not just be in this room all the time. Uh, I don't recall us doing an event, you know, in a uh, low-income neighborhood in, in the area. Uh, my memory is faulty. I apologize, um, but I think it's going to have to come down to you know, going to them, going to where the people who are underrepresented are existing. Um, 
And even that might not be sufficient because you could say we're going to have a forum in this in this one room and no one could show, show up. You have to actually do the additional legwork to say, you literally, just as you invited people here, you, you might do some actual invitation and dra drag people out. Um, it's not something that's going to happen um, with you know the, the minimum effort uh, because even on a good day. Uh, uh, for any part of this community, most of these sessions are not well attended. Patty? Right. Yeah, I just, um, I think this is a discussion worth having. Uh, I, I'm not sure we should just continue like this if we're having open mic, but I, I did want to speak to it. And, uh, you know, I think the issue, the biggest issue here is race and that we have communities of color who don't engage in our um, civic um, government because of many reasons, but largely because they're, they feel very disconnected, but people are there. And I, I'm i not sure what could be in the charter. I think we could talk about this a little bit because it, it would be, I think, important to have the charter, I mean, I'd have to maybe look at it again, to actually say that we are committed to the inclusiveness of, of all people in our community, people of color, people of uh, different de gender identities, um, you know, people of different uh, backgrounds and neighborhoods and, you know, we've been kind of stressing uh, impoverished, but I, I think for our community the biggest issue to me is race and we don't see people of color engaged because of just structural racism in our society and cultural racism. And there are neighborhoods where there are very um, engaged citizens engaged in what's important to them. And I think of, you know, engaged around issues around employment and housing and, um, you know, health care. Those communities all exist. Um, it might be something that we need to think about as a community to address those communities in a way where they're invited to look at government as a place where their voices are really necessary and welcome. Um, I think, I, I, you know, I think we have to do the work of reaching other communities. When I was working on the Democratic com Town Committee, um, City Committee, we have a, um, um, a seat that's the, uh, I can't think of what's it? Yeah, affirmative action seat, which is always occupied by a white person. And uh, the one time we had it occupied by a person of color, a Spanish-speaking woman, Cuban woman, who's a citizen, has been here her whole life, um, she was afraid to come to the meetings. And what she said was, but Spanish people don't vote because they can't read the ballots, they can't read the information. And she said that this is several, you know, 10 years ago, eight, eight years ago or so. So, uh, you know, I think there are, lots of ways to fix this. Um, I think may maybe thinking about uh, a way to commit ourselves as a white community to open our community in different ways and then outside of the charter, um, then have those discussions and invitations and engagements with other communities. Um, I just want to add that Stan has actually asked me to speak in large part on this topic specifically and I don't know um, how you are imagining sort of making, connecting back to that piece. But um, part of what I brought for today was, you know, a process for really thinking about this. There is no quick fix, just to sort of reinforce what you were saying. On the other hand, there is no way in which to really silo this work off from other parts. Mm -hmm. And people who are really engaged with this work of inclusion and equity are really doing it at every level. Um, otherwise, it's um, really the difference between appreciating diversity and really empowering um, an organization to be equity and inclusion focused. And it starts exactly with these kinds of conversations. It starts by thinking about how to integrate this in this charter. This is exactly the conversation to be having. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, certainly if we wanted to think about that in the charter, how to be equity oriented and inclusion oriented, it is a lot of work. It is a lot of work. It's not a quick, discuss, you know, five minute discussion point. You could have a doctorate program literally on inclusion and equity. There are some, but um, it's, it's necessary work. 
Um, I'm not sure how the city can sort of claim to be inclusionary uh, if it isn't engaging in this work at every level. That's, that's important, Molly. I, I appreciate that. Are, are there any other questions that anybody wants to address specifically to, to Bill while he's standing there? So <laughs> helpfully. Just back to what you um, said about the city clerk issue. Mm -hmm. So it was recommended to you by the by the person that you were working with. Um, sorry. To he he made a flat recommendation, but he said that's that's the general trend in the state. Because of technical expertise. Yeah. That's what you okay. Yes. Thank you. I mean, there is, I guess, um, you can argue, of course, that you know, city clerk is different than city treasurer because it's about the elections, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, if you know, the cabal and the establishment appoints the city clerk the, of their choosing, they're going to run unfair election and rig the whole thing, and and, and won't be fair anymore. I mean, that's uh, the concern. I think you can sort of do the concern the other way that the, the majority mob puts in someone and screws over the minority and that the minority never gets a leg up because they have a, they have a political hack in there by the election now i think in our north ham experience neither extreme has happened we've had good city clerks mm -hmm. all the way through um so you know on one hand uh it is it's if it is a problem it's not it's not an urgent problem mm -hmm. elections run fine here <laughs> um uh, the question becomes, is, is, is it a potential problem down the road that because um, we don't get a lot of candidates for things a lot of the time? Mm -hmm. uh, so while we, we like our current city clerk, we liked our past city clerk, uh, when that city clerk steps down, if that baton is not easily handed off, might you elect somebody who doesn't know what they're doing? Uh, and we better to be able to vet people in a more of a professional job interview kind of way and make sure, maybe, maybe it's someone who's not from here, maybe it's someone who just has a resume of handling elections, that's like just the way cities hire town managers from other cities. Um, that's the debate that you have to have and the, and the general trend is to go in the, in the technical appointee way but obviously the clerk is a little bit different than other types of positions. Thanks. Bill. Did you guys ever discuss um, any structural changes, uh, uh, different like uh, a professional town manager and a different type of council or select board? Uh, board Alder. Very briefly at the at the top, um, I think I think it was I think it was one of our first sessions. Um, uh, we're you know we're just kind of starting fresh. Like, do we want to rethink the whole thing? Uh, the consultant said, "What do you want to do? Go to town meeting? You know, who, who does that?" <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's going away from that, you know, towards this. Um, so uh, it, it wasn't, a, it, I don't call it being a deep discussion in overhauling the entire structure. Uh, I think there was a general agreement that, you know, North Ham's a pretty well-run city. Uh, we have, you know, we have a good bond rating. We attract new residents. Um, uh, we don't have uh, a serious uh you know, run to the core situation to to fix, and so it's, so we did the tweak of the mayor being taken off of uh, the council meetings and electing the term and not doing a broader overhaul. Robbie, one more thing going back to the city clerk issue. So, um, when you discussed uh, the city clerk being appointed, was it ever um, talked about it being the mayor versus the city city council? Appointing. Did you mean the appointing? Yeah. I don't know if we got to that level of debate. We might have, and I'm just forgetting. Okay. Um, I That's don't fine. recall. It, it was it was more on the space of are we are we appointing or not appointing? Yeah. Okay. Um, but that would obviously come into play. Who who is doing the appointing? <laughs> when, 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 once you get to that question. And, and I, I would imagine it would be. It would be joint. The council would nominate, and the mayor would approve. I guess it doesn't have to be that way. Well, it's the appointment process, yeah, yeah. as it stands now. But I, I think East Hampton does it, but I think it's exclusively the council. Yeah, I've spoken with a, a couple other 
city clerks too that are, or one in particular that's appointed by the city council and had a lot to say. So I was just curious if no, you had any. I don't think we got, I could be wrong, but I don't think we got deep into that. Okay, thanks very much, Bill. That was very helpful and, and instructive, and you, you raised some very uh, legitimate and important issues. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. All right, I want to move now to <coughs> our next discussion, which is, in fact, the uh, question of uh, appointed versus elected city clerk. Robbie, can you update us? We we had made an effort, I think, to have someone here representing one of the associations. Right, so I made my way down the list of newly elected officials for the Massachusetts City Clerks Association, and I heard back from most of them. Um, one person that's willing to, to speak with us, would like to speak with us, just couldn't do it this evening. Um, so we can talk about that. Uh, but not, it, most, most of them have, um, meetings or in the budget process like Northampton is and couldn't entertain coming out to speak with us or, or just didn't want to. Okay. Um, I tried. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. We'll, so we'll, we'll, um, we'll talk at some point during this discussion about uh, scheduling another meeting to, to it, was this a woman from Holyoke? Mm, no. Where, where is this person from? from um, hang on. Beverly. Beverly. Okay. He, he and he was very, you know. And he's a what? Which is, which group is he representing? Um, he is appointed by the city council. No, but council. which is he one of the? He's the. I'm sorry. He's the. Um, the secretary. Okay. Yeah, secretary of the MCCA. Good. All right. Yep. We'll, we'll talk about scheduling a time when he can come yep. and address us. Yep. Uh, I I did uh, uh, reach uh, all three of the prior city clerks in Northampton. Uh, Wendy Mazza is here to, to talk with us tonight. Um, if you want to come up to the podium, Wendy. Um, I, I, if, if you have any, any thoughts you'd like to share with us, go ahead. Well, I think I'd like to start, first of all, by saying that the office always had a natural progression of, of city clerks. Um, when I started in 1971, I worked for Mr. Faulkner. Um, at that time, Mr. Faulkner was in the office from 1960 to 1976. He passed away in the office. At that point, um, the assistant, which was Adeline Murray, uh, became the acting city clerk until the next election. And Adeline worked in the office uh, prior to that from 1977 to 1989. Um, and then when Adeline decided to retire, Christine Skorupski became the city clerk from 1990 to 2003. And Christine decided to take the early retirement that the city had offered. And it was too late at that point to actually get my name on the ballot. So I had to run as a sticker candidate with two other um, candidates. So I was in the office from 2004 to June of 2017. So there was always a natural progression of people that knew the department, knew the job, and um, never had a problem sliding into that particular position. Um, that being said, um, not taking anything away from the, the current city clerk, um, she did work in my office, so she did know the structure of the office. Um, but when I left, I had an opportunity to think back of if there was not someone that could take over and know something about the department, it would be horrible. It would be a huge, huge problem for the city. I mean, we don't, do, the office doesn't just do dog licenses. I mean, you all have to understand what the job entails. I mean, you have elections, you have vital records, um, you have documents that you file every day. So, I mean, you need to have someone that knows the office and knows the job. You can't have someone walking off the street and sitting in there and saying, okay, well, you know, I'm there to make the $74,000 for a salary and I don't need to worry about what the job entails. And so it's changed my mind as far as it becoming an elected position. I mean, right now you have a city clerk that knows the job, but God forbid if something happened to her, you have no one to step in because her assistant doesn't live here. 
in Northampton. So you end up with this huge problem and you can't reach out to another clerk in another community because they have to be a registered voter here in Northampton. So that has changed my thought on that, where at least if you were going to, um, if, this, if there was an issue with this, you could reach out, you could advertise, you could pull a clerk in from any community that was willing to come here for the amount of money that, and, and, you know, that the city was offering them. And they could come in and, you know, no downtime. They would know exactly what they were doing. I mean, they may not know the, the, the setup of the office, but they would know how to do vital records. They would know how to handle all of that stuff. And so that's the important piece of it. It has nothing to do with, you know, 10 years ago when, before, 10 years ago when the Charter Commission started to talk about it, oh yeah, I was against it because I was still, I saw many years down the road for myself. So yes, I was. But my life changed in, in June of, of 2017 and I had no choice but to leave prior to my, um, my term being up. And so I, I saw the problems that this could, this could really inflict you know, on the office. And I'm only think, thinking about the office in general and the citizens of Northampton. They need to be able to be served in that department and they need to be served by someone that knows what they're doing. You cannot rely on your staff to teach somebody that's making $74,000 a year. You need to have somebody that knows the job when they come in there. Thanks, Wendy. Questions? Well, Bill. And Wendy, to your point exactly, is that, as I recall, everyone who ran against you yep. was not qualified. Exactly. Had they won, mm -hmm. we would, and the one thing you didn't mention, which is a critical understanding of mass general law mm -hmm. as it pertains to the office, mm -hmm. because someone who doesn't know, doesn't know the inner workings of the office, doesn't know the structure of how, how to run and manage that office, and doesn't know mass general law, that puts a city in considerable liability. It does, absolutely. And I mean, it's not, the, I mean, the, their gover the clerk's office is not only gov governed by uh, the Secretary of State for uh, elections, we also have the Registry of Vital Records for the vital records. I mean, so you have a lot of oversight that's there. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, uh, whoever is gonna be in charge of the clerk if it becomes an appointment, isn't going to be the person that's going to come down there and say, no, you're gonna do it this way. There are laws to protect the, the clerk from a actually you know, handling this stuff. I mean, you can't, you can't change the law. The law is the law. And I mean, so the city would be in, in, in a really horrible situation if that happened. And it would be the same with election too. I mean, you know, I mean there, are, there are election laws and you have to abide by them. If you don't, well then you know, sooner or later you're gonna get caught and the city's gonna be held liable for it. I mean, I do believe that, you know, the, the job to me was, is just as important as the city treasurer's job was, and I still, tr I firmly believe that the, there should be special legislation done and not put on the ballot um, as, as you did with the, the city treasurer. I believe that that's the, the function of this committee to make that recommendation, and I believe that that's the way it should be done. Other, other questions for Wendy? So, uh, Wendy, just to summarize then, you worked uh, in, this, in the clerk's office uh, for 36 years? 45 and a half. 40, I'm, I'm sorry, 40, yes, 40, 40, nearly 46 years, yep. right. So you're now saying that, um, when you say there was a natural progression, over those years there was someone who had worked uh, for, for a number of years in the clerk's office who took over and was elected upon the retirement or death of, of Exactly, of the it was clerk. always, it, it ended up to always be the assistant mm -hmm. that came forward and ran and became the city clerk. Mm -hmm. For myself, I started as a junior clerk pinning fishing holders. So I worked my way up from a junior clerk to a senior clerk to a principal clerk to assistant and then I ran as city clerk. So I mean, you know, you have to know the jobs. You have to be able, if your staff for some reason doesn't show up, the office still has to run and you better know the job. Otherwise, if you don't know the job, you know, uh, the general public isn't gonna be too happy with you. Right, and so at, at this point then, um, your uh, considered opinion after having worked in that clerk's office for 40, close to 46 years is that to 
prevent the election of an unqualified person, Absolutely. you feel that you feel now that the, the the job should be appointed. Absolutely, because okay. there is absolutely no job description for that position, so it could be anybody. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Marianne, you had previously sent us some <coughs> communication or written a communication about this. Um, um, but I had written a letter um, in May, and I brought it up to the mayor's office for Lynn to bring it in. And I'm here tonight to talk about uh, the appointed versus the elected city clerk. Um, I think Wendy has echoed quite a bit of what I have written on that letter in May. And also, too, I want to add on about George Zimmerman when he was elected as treasurer. And with Mary Claire Higgins, our mayor at that time, approached George later on. And George had talked with me about how he agreed to go ahead with a non-elected position. And to be honest with you, I think it's the right way to go. If you look on how our departments are running now, extremely efficient. As a city councilor, I wanted to give you my perspective of appointed versus elected city clerk. The only qualification of an elected city clerk is being 18 years old. You need to look up this stuff. That's why in May, I said I had to write this. A resident of Northampton, a registered voter in Northampton, and not convicted of certain disqualifying crimes. And I want everybody to know on the charter committee, this has nothing to do with our city clerk right now. It is something that I feel that is very, very valuable here because of what I actually saw with George Zimmerman's elected position and then going into a non-elected position. I, I, I just feel like what Wendy is saying tonight is the same thing that I have written, that for any reason something ever happened to our city clerk, no matter who it is, him or her, right, we could be in deep trouble. There is no question about it. I think that Northampton has been very fortunate to have elected city clerks who had worked in the office for years and were qualified for the position of city clerk. But that may not always be because things do happen. And I think Wendy just brought that up. If the position was appointed by the mayor or administration and confirmed by city council, the mayor or the administration <coughs> could establish qualifications, very important, uh, for education and experience. Elected city clerks have no job descriptions and answer only to the voters. That's important here. We want people who are qualified, and I think Councillor Dwight just brought up of an issue of people running who are not qualified. This can happen, happen. Appointed would, would also allow for a larger field of qualified candidates, which would bring a higher level of continuity to the office if the appointed city clerk turns out to be a bad appointment, then the mayor or the administration would have the mechanism to fire the appointment. Right now, nothing could ever be done. Thank God we have somebody who knows how to run that office, but if somebody was in there, they're in there until the next election. Being able to go outside of Northampton for qualified candidates is an essential part of making sure you have the best candidates for the <coughs> office and for the city of Northampton. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, Pam, as the current city clerk, do you wish to address this? I, I'm going to disqualify myself from speaking about the issue. I think that there's a conflict of interest if I give you my personal opinion. I respect your decision and your decision-making uh, process. It seems pretty open and transparent to me, so I wish you luck. 
Can I ask Pam a question? Yes, yes, Bill. Pam, um, and as Wendy will probably testify as well, the position of the clerk's office has changed significantly over time. The responsibilities and duties and obligations by law have also increased exponentially. Mm -hmm. As have the systems, the, the functional systems, the requirements for licensure, the requirements for uh, 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 document preservation and, and embedment. Is that a word? Did I just make that up? It um, works. It works. So from the time that, for, for instance, when Wendy first started, to the arc of, my God, Wendy, almost half a century. <laughs> <laughs> but so much has changed. And um, the, the concern of an unqualified person winning an election, um, and, I, and I know, I, I remember some people who ran for city clerk, and it shudder to think that had they won, what, what would have resulted? Because the critical, I, I think the, the city clerk's office is undervalued as, as one of the most elemental and important features of the city functioning. And so I just want you to confirm, if you would, that I'm not making that up, that the, 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 the job now is, is probably beyond the scope of anyone just walking off the street and impulsively deciding they want an elected office, they think the clerk's office is the one to go for, because it's, I mean, what do you do? You give out a license or two and, you know, give people directions <laughs> to whatever, where the bathroom is and stuff like that. I know you guys do that too, but. <laughs> Mostly the parking. Where's the parking? Yeah, right. Where's the nearest parking? Um, I, you know, to, to that point, Bill, I think the technical requirements <coughs> of that particular position might be unique depending on the municipality that a person, you know, oversees. I mean, we may not have the same systems as others, but certainly the, um, the technical requirements according to Mass General Law have become more complicated as we see more people making um, freedom, of, freedom of information requests, um, as we see more uh, people wanting more transparency in election, as we see a lot of election um, activity and what could go wrong in if you know, if we had certain processes in place for an election, for, fortunately, our secretary of the state feels very strongly about not having an electronic system and indicates that he will not um, allow an electronic, you know, way to cast your ballot while he's in office. Um, so, yeah, it has become more complicated. And even some of the stuff when I first started, um, is just so different, so vastly different than what it is today. Robbie? One of the things that came up in the last meeting um, after I spoke with Mary Nardowitz, city clerk, mm -hmm. since Steph yep. was that yep. she feels that it's even more difficult to be the city clerk in a hospital community, and I wasn't quite sure what she meant by that, but Sam helped me, or not Sam, I'm sorry. Lynn. Lynn helped me understand um, a little bit more. Can you speak to that, of, of what the added, um, what's well, added to your position because of that? If you, if you, it's, and it's not just hospitals, it's also nursing homes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's any um, facility that will generate a vital record. Mm -hmm. So for us, you know, we see, we can see upwards of 800 births a year. Um, you know, so, I, and so the vol, it's the volume piece that's really um, sort of makes it difficult. Mm -hmm. Because we are the community that generates that record, any time that somebody needs to make an amendment for the record, that information has to be again, generated in in the community where the record um, started from. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I can't even tell you, I mean, Wendy would probably, you know, keel over if she knew that, you know, in the past month alone, we probably have processed 10 amendments mm -hmm. to vital records. Um, you know, things such as, um, you know, incorrect spelling of names, um, people wanting to change their gender markers, 
um, people uh, deciding that they they you know they they thought that they wanted this one name and then need to you know have it changed for another reason. So all of these things are complicating factors to. Um, when it comes to vital records, mm -hmm. so it's it's really been crazy. We've mm -hmm. we've uh, you know seen a large amount. So if so if you're not the the community that initiates the record, mm -hmm. then you're the receiving community, and all you need to do is issue the record when somebody comes in and requests it. But if you're the community that has a hospital that has seven nursing homes that has you know all of these um, facilities that. Are, feed into that one system, then it, it makes it more complicated. We're dealing with funeral directors, we're dealing with the medical examiner, we're dealing with the, the parents, we're dealing with um, people who you know want their vital record, that sort of thing. Um, the other thing that's made it more interesting is of course the real ID. People um, we've seen our, our vital records requests grow um, Twenty-five percent, and it will continue to grow until everybody gets their real ID. Because you not only need to have your driver's license to get your real ID, but if you've changed your name when you got married, then you need to have your marriage certificate. Um, if you got divorced and then remarried, you have to show the entire um, process of that name progression throughout the years. When you go, when you step into the registry, so you know it's not just the the the, um, the how complex it is; it's the volume as well. So, thank you. Wow. <clears throat> uh, succession planning and staff development is a big issue for all organizations, particular municipal governments. Mm -hmm. um, if you are unburdened by the challenge of having to run for election every couple years and if you you know serve in a longer term appointed capacity do you envision an environment where training opportunities exist and other other uh, avenues for you to train your staff such that when you're not there or when it's time for you to leave there would be someone who'd be ready to step in for you well, fortunately, um, th those avenues exist today. I just came back from Plymouth last week where I spent a couple of days um, at the municipal clerks. Uh, the Actually, the town clerks association holds um, quarterly meetings where they have different training programs. Um, and I am working towards my uh, certified municipal clerks um, professional accreditation. Um, and members of the staff have also indicated that they are interested as well. I mean, we're taking full advantage wherever we can. We've closed down the office for a couple of hours so that everyone can participate in training that affects everyone. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're making that happen. Yeah. But certainly if, it, you know, if I could spend less time on the campaign trail, you know, uh, that would be just more time I'd be spending you know, doing other things, so. Okay, thank you, Pam. Thanks. Is there anyone else in the audience who wants to address the question of appointed versus elected city clerk? I wasn't going to speak, but I, I think. Oh, I'm, we, mm -hmm. I just, you. I wanted to add to what um, Wendy said, and thank you, Wendy, for your remarks, and, um, and obviously for Pam and the great job she's doing. I do think, you know, looking at cities, um, just statistically speaking, um, there's 48 cities in Massachusetts now, and only 42 of them have appointed city clerks. Um, it used to be 42 out of 47. Framingham just became a city. Um, their elected city clerk was the chair of the Charter Commission. She voted in favor of switching to an appointed city clerk, um, and they did move to an appointed city clerk. I just think that um, the fact that we've become as municipal government has become more professionalized and we're delivering these vital services. Another great example is veteran services. For many years, you know, that was a job that was just like, you know, whoever was the most highly decorated VFW member got to be the, 
the veteran service officer. Mm -hmm. But like, it's a critical position where you're providing benefits and you have to be basically a social worker and know how to access mm -hmm. the system and you have to have the training and you have to, you know, and so we've now moved and, you know, Steve Connor's actually been a leader on that in the state that you have to get certified to be a veteran service officer because like there's veterans out there that need these benefits and like you need to know how to provide them. And um, the treasurer's a great example. The other thing is that this is a city department um, with, um, you know, employees that are represented employees that work in the office um, that you have to supervise. You're managing an office. You're managing a budget within an office. Um, and to have this one department head who's kind of segregated off to the side um, doesn't have a salary doesn't fit within her his or her peers. Um, you know, everyone else's salary are on a salary a professional salary scale, and they have regular increases. Um, and so it's you know, we did the when Wendy when the new charter passed, you know, there were compensation changes, but I think if you look now, you know, however many years it's been, the city clerk has probably fallen behind all of her peers in terms of, you know, the auditor and the collector and the treasurer, other people who are running these professional offices and supervising. So, um, and then for me, the other issue is the fact that this is the person whose name is on the ballot who's also running the election. Um, I just think there's a fundamental issue with that. Um, and there is an exemption for town clerks um, in the ethics laws of the state, but there is not an exemption for city clerks, um, probably because there's only five of us that have an elected city clerk, and the majority are appointed, so it's not an issue. So um, I think this is sort of the final piece of the modernization of our charter, you know, the treasurer position. I mean, the idea that we picked somebody to manage our $100 million checkbook by a popularity contest, just I shudder to think about it. Um, but that's how we used to do it. And um, you wouldn't do that, you know, in any other setting. Um, so the idea that you're going to entrust somebody with your vital records of your community, you're going to entrust the person to be the custodian of public records, you're going to entrust this person who's going to basically manage and receive any lawsuits that are served against the city. I mean, there's a whole myriad of, of um, and then obviously running our elections, um, that you would entrust that to the winner of a, basically a popularity contest just doesn't seem right to me. So, um, so I do think this is kind of the final piece of modernizing our charter. Um, and also, just from um, the mayor's point of view, trying to modernize, you know, whatever it is, do modernization across all departments, whether it's in software, whether it's, um, um, you know, training or, or, or other things, to have a department head, again, is sort of off to the side um, and is independent. Um, and that it also just creates um, uh, an oddity there as well that I think is an anachronism. So that's my take on it. If you want to ask me questions, you, I'm Mayor. happy to do that. Any, any questions for the mayor on this issue? Okay, thank the you. The only thing I would mention, the question about appointment, um, I know different communities do it uh, differently, and I'm, I'm sort of, I have an open mind about that. My only concern is, um, is then, because we used to have some positions that were appointed by the city council, and by de facto, they were then uh, theoretically supervised by the city council. Um, and I think that becomes challenging to have a multi-member board that can only meet in public supervising, a, and, and our somewhat part-time-ish, you know, not here all day long, how do they supervise someone? So that's just the other challenge. Um, and I know some of our neighbors to the south have similar arrangements like that where it becomes challenging. The, the biggest challenge that actually occurred for us was exactly, it was protecting an employee's privacy uh, discussion when you know, no other position is publicly vetted and discussed. And there were some circumstances, for instance, one citizen took a scunner to one, one of our appointed persons and uh, just did this really aggressive kind of hideous campaign against her and it all had to play out in public um now that's something that would not happen if if it if it were under the executive aegis as opposed to the council we have to conduct this in public and as as and it really it's unfair to the employees ultimately that is one of the I, that's one I, I had completely forgotten about as one aspect of having council appointment oversight <clears throat> over a professional position that's again our qualifications for reviewing someone's mm. qualifications are 
fairly limited in that respect because we don't have a full-time position. We don't have somebody uh, through HR. We don't. We didn't go through HR. We would just sort of ask questions in public that were not particularly thoughtful necessarily, or, or at least informed. And um, and I knew it was difficult for the employees. It's tough to come uh, stand in front of the podium here and speak before the public to talk about your job and your qualifications for the job, and especially if you're being dressed down by someone in the public. So. Mm -hmm. I would just suggest that we figure out a, a clear job description given Marianne's description of the quali current qualifications for r running for this position. She said, as long as you don't commit a crime and you're a citizen and you live in a city. So it's, I, clearly we've learned that it's an incredibly elaborate um, um, sort of in a digital age uh, evolving job. So. Well, if it was if it was professionalized and made appointed, we would HR department would create a job yeah. description, and there's plenty of other examples. You know, there's 42 other examples <laughs> right. of job descriptions, so we'd be able to do that, and then we'd be able to have it graded and place it on a scale with commensurate department heads, and it would fit in the same way. So, yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Those are my comments. Anyone else in the audience want to address this topic? Yes. I was just walking by. Do you want me to stand up? Yes, there? please. And oh, okay. could you identify yourself, please? Sorry, I just was going for a walk, literally. And but I'm testing out my hearing aids. Huh? I just got my hearing aids, so I actually was walking around to test my hearing aids out. So here I am testing my hearing aids out. Who are you? It's not. It's uh, so I'm going to sit back there and try to listen and. The acoustics uh, are very, very, um, are difficult back wow. there. There's actually, um, you, there's access through uh, NCTV back there that you can get. Uh, oh, headsets. Uh, headsets for even, even though my hearing aids are brand new, I have to get headsets. Well, I don't know. It doesn't matter about the age of the hearing aid, so I suspect that it would work. Oh, okay. Okay, well, I'll just sit there anyway. Okay. Don't mind me. Okay. <laughs> and congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I uh, I talked with uh, both uh, Adeline Murray and Christine Skrupski, the two other living uh, previous city clerks, neither of whom could be here tonight. I'll briefly, s they, they, they said essentially the same thing to me, and I'll summarize it briefly. Both uh, f see no reason to change from an elected to an appointed city clerk. Both feel that uh, they serve the people, the city clerk serves the people of Northampton and the people of Northampton should be their, their bosses. I think they were concerned about uh, the appointment process. If, if the city council uh, was the appointing authority that they would then have multiple bosses. If the mayor was the appointing authority that they feared it would be a political appointment. So both uh, Christine and Adeline advocated for keeping the clerk's position elected. Robbie, have you spoken to any, any other um, clerks since your I report have. at the last meeting? Yeah, so we covered Amherst and East Hampton during the last um, meeting, and I have since spoken with um, three others. So Keith Rattel, who was elected in Chicopee, it was a very dramatic phone call. Um, so he, believes it's more beneficial to be elected, doesn't want to be under anybody's thumb, these are quotes, whether it's the mayor or the city council. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, it's not, a, not much, I'll read you what he said. Politics can be a battleground, I answer to the people. Um, it's important, if in charge of the ballot box, to be an independent authority dealing with the people's right to vote. Um, said the last mayor eight years ago in Chicopee started a petition drive to extend the mayoral term from two to four years to get it on the ballot. I'm not sure what, it, uh, I can't remember exactly what number he said because I think I wrote it down wrong, but many signatures, he says, were presented to him, and this was all covered in the news, were forged. Um, it went to court. He, he said had he been appointed by the mayor, he would have been very difficult to say anything, could have cost him his job. Um, 
said the mayor was an unscrupulous individual and it wasn't right. He brought the issue to the city council. The campaign manager was found to be responsible. Um, he believes candidates should campaign on their skills and knowledge and the voters will figure it out. So that's Mr. Rattel. Um, I then spoke with, bear with me here, um, Wes, who is from Beverly, Wes Slate. He's appointed by the city council. Um, there's 41,000 people in Beverly, a strong mayor, city council form of government. City clerk was appointed by, or has been appointed by the city council since 1996 when their new charter was voted in. Settled on the strong mayor with a two-year term as CEO, department heads report to him. City council power was decreased, but the charter committee, and this is interesting, um, made the city clerk elected by their nine-member city council. Wes is in his fourth year, deals mostly with the city council president as an agent of the city council. He feels it gives a leg up to the legislative branch, makes it more independent. They also created a new position in Beverly at the same time called the city council budget management analyst, which is an independent voice for the city council with full access to city department heads and to say in, in quotes, how do we pay for it? So he is paid by the hour up to half the salary of the city finance director. It is Wes's strong opinion that the city clerk should be more connected to the city council versus the mayor. And the last person I got in touch with was Brenna McGee from Holyoke. Um, she said she's been the elected city clerk there for five years, has never held a different appointed clerk position, so can really only speak to her opinion on elected versus appointed. In her role as a city clerk, she's a, let's see, elected position but still considered a department head that is allowed to choose her own assistant, which she feels um, benefits the office because she's the best qualified to know the needs of the office and what the staffing needs are opposed to having appointments made for her. Um, she, she wrote me, so I'm just going to read her exact words. It keeps my office independent from outside political pressure, giving the residents the right to choose the city clerk, also take takes away the politics of having the appointment made by either the mayor or the city council. I also feel as the person running the elections, I shouldn't be chosen by a person or group of people that would be seeking re-election. As an elected official, you are directly accountable to the people then that elect you rather than just a small board or a mayor. Also, I am a believer that department heads should also live in the city or town they are serving, and being an elected city clerk ensures you live in the city you are holding the position in. Lastly, I feel there is no valid reason why the right to vote on this very important position should be taken away from the citizens. Um, and I think she, I haven't spoken with her directly. It's been hard to get her on the phone. I think she would be willing to come speak with us. I'm not positive, um, but I can try if we she, want. She is also an officer in the association. Yes, yeah, she's the vice president. Yeah. Yes, Lynn. Um, did either of those three discuss how they run elections? No. And so it is, I, I'm sorry, what is Wes's last name? Wes um, Slate. Slate, yeah. Slate. It is uh, Wes Slate who um, was more than happy to, to come speak with us. Okay. And he is a strong advocate of an appointed city clerk by the city council, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Bill. Worth noting, I think that everyone that Robbie's talked to is very much in favor of the of the circumstances that, that they're, they're in. Um, yeah, absolutely. Right. It's not, you know, they they have very strong opinions about the the way that they achieve their particular office. Except Barbara Lombard, who has been both, and she said she could have it either way. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. David. mayor theory of um, of why a mayor shouldn't be in charge of appointing someone because I've, I've, I've heard this so much over time I mean we used to have a board of health um, arrangement where the board of health was elected by the city council and then the board of health actually hired and supervised the health department director um, and it was complete chaos and we 
um, the Board of Health really couldn't supervise. They were lovely people. They were volunteers. They had full-time jobs. But to assume that they could supervise, hire and supervise a department head um, just didn't make sense. And um, when we were looking at a special act, um, the arguments were like the mayor's going to politicize public health or the mayor's going to, I mean, you could pretty much make that argument for every department in the city. You can't have the mayor appoint the police chief. He'll politicize it. You cannot have the mayor appoint the fire chief. He'll politic he or she'll politicize it. You know, we used to have a board of public works that hired and supervised the public works director um, and literally had a public works director tell the mayor, sorry, I don't work for you, so I'm not coming to city council to talk about why the roads weren't plowed. I'm not sure if you were on the council. <laughs> Councilor Barge might have been. But um, I just feel I, I just feel that if you're elected as the CEO of the um, of the city, you're going to, and if you hire people who are hacks and are unprofessional and can't do the job, then that's going to be quite evident, and it'll be immediately evident to whoever the appointing uh, confirming authority is, which is again is the check on the mayor. So if the mayor, you know, if that mayor of Chicopee uh, wants to appoint, you know, his brother-in-law or whoever it is. The city council is, is the check, or vice versa. Um, you need to have a check and balance on it. But again, this idea that there are these positions that cannot, that you know, can't be elected by. We allow an elected school committee to appoint our, you know, to hire and supervise our superintendent of schools, arguably the the chief educational officer of the city. So I just that's sort of a a fear um, that keeps getting expressed, and I just feel that it's not, it, it's, you could basically make that argument for, for every office. And again, I don't know how you get beyond the fact that the person who's running the elections is on the ballot themselves. I mean, if you say, if the mayor were running the election, you would say, well, that's not right. Or if the city council was running the election, you'd say, that's ridiculous. How can they run the election and they're on the ballot? Yet we have a person that we elect who's on the same ballot in the election that we're, I mean, you could make an argument that, yeah, I'm a little concerned about uh, challenging that person. Maybe they're not going to check my papers correctly. Are they going to certify all my signatures? Are they going to play? You know, you could make all these arguments. Um, so anyway, that's just, I just, I, um, not to defend mayors, but I do, because there are certainly mayors out there that are unscrupulous, um, but I just think that this idea that there's this magical position that is different than all the other uh, functions of the city, um, that thereby it can't be professional, it has to be elected. I think we've slowly moved away from elected boards of health, elected treasurers, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and this is sort of a natural progression. So. Thanks, Lynn. I just wanted to add, just to make sure that everyone understood, right now department heads, with the exception of the city clerk, are all appointed by the mayor, confirmed by council. So that exists currently for treasurer collector, auditor, DPW director, senior center director. So it's not the, it's not a different process than what's already happening for the rest of the city departments. I could have filtered out some of what they said, but I just decided to I give like, it all, like all to you. And, yeah, and, and, and that was one of those, was it was high drama, and I understand that, that I'm still getting over, you know. <laughs> Ro uh, Robbie, if you haven't already, you'll forward to Annie mm -hmm. whatever written communication you have from the, the clerks, mm -hmm. okay. So having heard um, testimony both tonight and at the last meeting, what additional information um, do committee members want about this issue? None. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think we've exhausted this. <laughs> okay. So. Um, My only concern, yes, sorry. Go ahead. My only concern is that with the election conversation, we did a great job publicizing it. We, there was a story in the newspaper. With this issue, there has been, I don't think, any coverage of it. Um, and so I would just maybe suggest that we try to do that same thing, even if it's just written comments, before we make a final recommendation. Bill. I, I would agree with that. I, it's, it's worth noting, though, the principal objector the person who actually stood as the bulwark in opposition of changing this position in the charter just testified before us rather strongly that she now favors an appointed position, and and that that is significant. And and also, Council of the Barge, as I recall, was also opposed to um, changing from elected to appointed. 
and she too spoke rather strongly. And I think those those two voices were the loudest to begin mm -hmm. with. Right. At it. And it's I'm grateful for their change of heart and their courage to come and speak so candidly about that. But I, I take Lynn's point. I think it's kind of important to, because there were people who supported those positions as well, who, who also weighed in and be worth hearing from them if, if they're prepared to be heard. Th that, Bob. You know, I think the, the preponderance of testimony has supported the trend of 42 to 7. Um, certainly the various professional aspects of the entire operation are abundantly clear to us. And perhaps, Bill, you might want to write something to the newspaper and just reflect that it, it's the intention of the council to support the move to an appointed clerk, having heard all this testimony, but we wish to hear if there is any others that we've missed. But on the basis of what's come forward to us now, on the basis of a very clear trend that's occurred in the Commonwealth, we feel very comfortable at this time going with a recommendation to move to an appointed clerk. Yeah, Bob, I think at this point it's, it's appropriate for us as a committee to seek any additional comment saying that we're moving toward a recommendation for an appointed clerk rather than the city council. Isn't, I mean, that, that's isn't that why we're here tonight on television? Because we, we wanted that to happen tonight? Didn't we publicize this meeting? Yes, yes. But, um, I, I mean, I think, you know, I, I, I agree with both Lynn and, and, and Bill that we should be, uh, out of an abundance of caution, we should be very uh, transparent in, in, in now telling the public, and there, there has been no outside of our, you know, our agenda, uh, outside of a communication that was sent to department heads and municipal officials, outside of the people we had specifically invited, there's been no publicity about the fact that we're on the verge of recommending an appointed city clerk. I, and certainly not, we're not gonna vote that tonight. So I don't, uh, I don't object to, um, you know, making further efforts to, to publicize that. Bill. Uh, to that, um, at every council meeting, I report the progress and the discussion that we have in this committee, and I, I think I would feel more comfortable if, I mean, Bob has actually made an assumption. We haven't had a vote, so I don't know. I mean, I, this, if I read the room, <laughs> but I, I agree with you, but I would, li I would feel more comfortable to uh, report that there was a vote of the committee, a uh, straw vote if you will, the, uh, either favoring or opposing or divided vote that reflects the current thinking of the committee as far as uh, changing the position to an appointed position. You want to take that straw vote tonight? I, that would make me feel comfortable that in my report that I could at least say that this portion of the committee had decided this way. Is, it, is that a motion? That's a motion for a straw vote for, for the question. Second. Discussion. Is there any reason why you could you couldn't write something to the newspaper in addition? Oh, um, <clears throat> no. Uh, we certainly certainly that would be part of our effort to further publicize mm -hmm. our 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 work on this. Stan has some connections. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um. Do you, but Bill, do you want the straw vote to be a roll call vote? Um, I would be perfectly comfortable with a voice vote. Okay. All right. The uh, proposal, uh, the, the motion then is to, um, uh, is to have a straw vote tonight on a recommendation that the city, uh, a recommendation by the charter uh, committee that the city move to an appointed city clerk. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That's I, I have my answer. Thank you. That is <laughs> eight to zero. That's a straw vote, Annie. Okay. Can I just add one quick thing? Yeah. <laughs> so in speaking with all these people, you know, I came into the this thing feeling one way, um, and then it, speaking with a few of them gave me some 
pause, um, but hearing from others tonight <coughs> kind of dawned on me, like I think I was operating more on a place, it's kind of sad to eliminate an elected position. I think that's what, you know, it's, it's you almost feel like you're going against democracy when you're having fewer elected positions, but I feel like because of it, what's been very well stated, the, the progression of the, of the position and what it entails, and I think back to the last election for city clerk, I really, I, I just think it, it, it makes sense. And that's all I wanted to say. And which method really advances democracy in the end? Mm -hmm. It's clear, you know, sometimes it doesn't always look like a, an election. Right. Um, <clears throat> so in addition to soliciting any uh, opinions from the constituencies in Northampton, does anyone want to have uh, Wes Slate come to, come to one of our meetings and uh, have a chance to talk with him? Or do we feel that that's not necessary? Sounds like he'd be disappointed that he wouldn't have the opportunity <laughs> to do it. I would, I, if he wants to drive out here from Beverly, he uh, was very gung ho about doing it. So I, I, I okay, I, sure. say let's hear him out. Okay, oh. I'll contact him. Do you have a preference for July or August? Well, Robbie, you've been the point person on this, and you you will not be here at the July meeting. I won't, and I just found that out. I apologize. I, so I, I mean. I, I guess why don't we? Can we postpone it until Robbie's available, or is well, it? yes, yes. Okay, good. That's what I'll I'll ask him in August. That, okay. that we ask if he's then available on August twentieth. Is that is that the date of our August meeting? I think so yes. Okay. And just to be clear, he knows we have no budget to pay to get him here, right? Right. We're not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. bring him up at the hotel or anything. No. Just, <laughs> I'm sure. Just from Beverly. I think he's, 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 he's just ride. very enthusiastic about Beverly. his job and. <laughs> And likes to talk, so yeah. <laughs> well, he'll be perfectly welcome here. Maybe Skype. That's what I was thinking too. Yeah. Oh, Skype. Oh, that's, oh, a, thought. that's a good idea. Da -da -da -da. I'll ask him. <laughs> okay. How advanced they are here! I mean, my goodness. Yeah. Well, you'll notice it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Robbie. Why don't you ask him about his availability on August twentieth? Okay. And. Um, ask if he has a preference for either Skyping with us or traveling out here at his own expense mm -hmm. to spend an evening in Northampton. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Does You're the welcome. office have a Zoom account or no, you can do we that? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's also free and unlimited. Yeah, I know we've used it before yeah. for yeah, other stuff. Okay, so uh, we'll then uh, between now and August 20th, we'll also publicize our work on this, seek any other op opinions that people wish to express, um, and schedule a vote for August 20th on, this, on the question. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, next, we have discussion of a possible amendment to Section 3.7. Temporary absence of the mayor, which was attachment one that went out with the agenda. I have copies if anyone needs them. If, yeah, if anybody, if anybody on the committee so doesn't have that. Um, so here's both of these. Yep. Thanks. Bob, do you need them? I got them. Okay. And I believe the mayor uh, will address this. So th this is one of these um, uh, interesting provisions of the charter that was in there, and we understand why it was in there. And it actually, um, the former charter had a provision exactly like this. It was a little more cryptic. It wasn't as spelled out, but it basically said that, you know, if the mayor um, is, no, is no longer able to serve, that the city council president then steps in as mayor. And I think this is sort of an acknowledgment of the federal and you know, structure where, you know, ultimately if the president and vice president become incapacitated, then the Speaker of the House becomes president. They're third in line to succession. Um, that would be great, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so, um, so I think that's sort of the, the not, so there was always this um, section in the charter. The way it was written in the charter, um, using the template that we had, though, 
Um, and it really has never played out the way, you know, this is written currently like a 25th Amendment kind of a thing where the council says, oh my goodness, I think the mayor has left and he didn't tell anybody, or I think the mayor's gone crazy, or, you know, whatever it is, and then convenes a meeting and says, we're going to take a vote and we need a supermajority to install our president as the acting mayor. What's mostly happened is that I've, if, if um, well, if I have to be, out of the city for an extended period of time where I, I wouldn't be able to like physically sign things. I've actually used the, um, but I'm still able to communicate real time. I can still, you know, text and talk and do all those things and fax. Um, I've used the provision in the charter, which is actually referenced here, which is to delegate certain authorities to people. So signing contracts, I sign all the contracts. Um, what I've typically done is if I'm gonna be gone for three or four or five days and there's an important contract, I've delegated that to Susan Wright, who's our finance director, who actually, by the way, signs all contracts anyway. So I've delegated that authority to that person. Um, if I'm gonna, if I've times where I've been doing like international travel a couple of times that I've done that, and I'm gonna be many time zones away, I've actually come to the city council kind of proactively and said, you really should enact this provision of the charter on such and such a date because I'm going to be away. Um, and so that's sort of how it's played out. And so what I've tried to capture in this language is kind of these two separate things, maintaining the kind of 25th Amendment piece, whereas if the mayor becomes incapacitated and is sick or has a heart attack or, or, <coughs> or has just you know run off to Vegas or whatever the possibility is, that the council still has the independent authority to say, look, we need to do something here, convene a meeting and appoint. Um, presumably, they're their president, but in the absence of the president, if the president doesn't want to serve, then the vice president, and then you know you're drawing lots. I think at that point, I'm not sure. Um, so what it says basically is that if um, if the if a mayor is going to be away for uh, ten business days or less, um, then the mayor should notify the council and the clerk in writing um, and designate somebody through that already existing power to delegate authorities. And again, you can't delegate, it's clear in what you can and can't delegate. You can't say chair of the school committee, you can't say you know, appoint people to permanent positions. It's only the things that are needed in a short period of time, contracts, things like that. Um, and so um, if you're, but then if you're going to be gone for longer than 10 business days, um, then notifying the council and the um, and the council president would serve as the um, as the acting mayor for those longer periods of an a of a longer absence, or if the mayor, you know, had to be out because of a medical issue and had to have sur major surgery and was going to be out, you know, that happened with Mayor Higgins where she had to have brain surgery and was incapacitated and uh, for many 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 weeks, and so um, I think it would be better in that case to have somebody who's been elected um, for, you know, by the voters to at least be seen as the person running the city for a longer period of time like that. So this kind of does the, if you're gone for t two weeks or less, or gone for two weeks or more, or if the mayor becomes incapacitated, and I talked to the city solicitor, incapacitation is kind of a, um, a legally defined term that can include lots of different things, but it's, there's plenty of legal definitions for it. Um, and so then the council would have the authority to invoke it. So that is my solution now, having done this for six or seven years and realizing that the current language really doesn't serve the real life needs of the city in that regard. Questions for the mayor, but Bill? The, um, <laughs> Having been on one side of this myself, and mm -hmm. you were actually ascension into the mayor's office, actually the same in a, in a similar fashion, and the um, and also what he said. I think back on the tornadoes that struck Pinebrook mm -hmm. Curve, uh, Mayor Higgins was in office at the time, but was away mm -hmm. at at a at a crisis, mm -hmm. and the council president took over emergency management. I and, and I that's what I always dreaded as council president that there's you'd be off somewhere and that suddenly there'd be some kind of emergency and I would think, well, I'm the least qualified person in the city of Northampton to, <laughs> to preside over an emergency within the community. And in fact, actually there was, there was a requirement that for me to get training and uh, emergency management training, which now I can say this now, because I'm not the council president, I didn't take. So 
<coughs> we dodged the bullet. I, I recall you were on one. I uh, think you were away. You were overseas, and the last night of your absence was when the Round Hill uh, fires occurred. Mm -hmm. And uh, I walked up, and one of the department heads said, "Well, you're you're the mayor." And I said, "No, <laughs> no, I, have, I don't know. I know nothing about putting out a yeah. fire. You guys do. You guys do this just fine." I have no, I don't listen to anything I say other than the fact the one thing that I am not going to tell you what to do. That you can listen to. Yeah. And in that case, the thing you, you would, the only thing you might be required to do as mayor is you have to, um, only a mayor can declare a state of emergency. Exactly. So if you have a situation, I mean, you're talking to the guy who was acting mayor for a week and we had the October snowstorm <laughs> where we lost power for, you know, however many days and I got to do a robocall canceling how <laughs> My Mayor. daughter cried. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I'm just saying, so that is the issue with act, being acting mayor. But I mean, we have an emergency manager for the city who's designated, that's the fire chief. And so they are the designated emergency manager that connects with FEMA and MEMA. And so, I mean, the mayor is there obviously to provide resources and coordination and ultimately to declare a state of emergency if that's needed. So that In this really, scenario, yeah. how would, who would declare an emergency? How would an emergency be declared? Well, I think the, the thing about it is in the modern world, I, you can sign a declaration of emergency from wherever you are. So, you know, if I'm in Boston at a mayor's conference and God forbid something happens, you can, th that can be issued. Interestingly, I was on vacation on the North Shore the year we were doing the charter and it was going through the legislature and they needed the mayor to sign something to the legislature attesting to some amendments that technical amendments and so I think you mailbox FedExed it to a mailbox etc where I was on vacation I got on my signed them and then sent them to the to the Beacon Hill so I mean I think you there's ways to do that with scanning and printing um, that you don't have to physically be here to carry out the duties I think for me like if I'm in if I'm three time zones away and don't have access to telecommunications or anything that's where I would want to have it um, delegated but obviously the the fire chief is the emergency manager and then you would delegate somebody to to um, to take over those responsibilities if they're needed. Yeah, I I appreciate this because I was deeply vested in your well-being. Yeah, and and <laughs> it, well, it was some comfort to you, but to me it, it kept me up at night. Yeah. <laughs> Lynn, did you have something? Yeah. yeah. Bob. Because th this the the transfer of power often occurs in an in an emergency. I'm wondering, Councillor, if it is explicit in here that electronic communications can suffice for for a letter meaning does he have to post a letter for it to happen yeah. and, I, and I, this did come up in one of the circumstances that i was involved in where so i, I, I want to be clear about the, the letter informing the the council yeah um well i mean the mayor is going to file a letter with the council and with the clerk if the mayor is out of town, he can fax in or or scan an email. Okay. Uh, I don't think that needs to be explicit in the charter because, I mean, that's just basic uh, contract and basic law in in this era. I mean, we all accept scanned emailed e letters. Email letters every day. And by the time and we do this again, the technology will probably change. I don't even right. think the mailbox, et cetera, exists. True. Right. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> So make sure you have a copy of your stationery on your laptop. Yeah, was, okay. <laughs> I usually do. It's on my phone. I can do it. <laughs> David, can you, um, I, I'm interested in the less than 10 days scenario. Yeah. Uh, can you give an example of a duty that you might uh, delegate to a department head that wouldn't already be under his or her purview? It's mainly the contract signing. Mm -hmm. That's the, I think people don't, there's a lot of contracts that come through my office and Lots of times it's it's an emergency. It's like yeah, I, you know, it, mainly because you waited too long to do that, whatever it is. But so there's sometimes there are sometimes though vital contracts like for paving or emergency repairs, um, and the mayor as chief executive officer has to sign every city contract. So that's probably the key one. So if you're going to be away, um, there's also the mayor signs the um, warrants for payroll and for. Um, and for uh, accounts payable, accounts payable um, which is what the, the 
treasurer collector and the auditor issuing payments to all of the various vendors um, and obviously issuing paychecks to all of the employees every two weeks. Um, and I sign, I'm the final sign off on all of those. So things like that, um, typically I would, I would, um, def I would delegate those to the chief financial officer, which is Susan Wright, um, to do. And that's typically the way it's played out if I'm going to be away. Um, again, I'm reachable, I can, but it's more the f need to physically sign things. But beyond that, there are some things that the charter explicitly says can't be done, can't be delegated. Mm -hmm. Can't issue vetoes, can't, you know, can't chair the school committee, can't appoint people to permanent positions, anything like that. <coughs> um, that would have to happen if you installed an, and even, even the acting mayor, I think they put some limits on what the acting mayor can or can't do. But, um, but that would be the typical thing that just to keep make keeping government going and these vital functions that have to happen um, but aren't super critical yeah well, thanks other questions or discussion about temporary absence of the mayor now I did not schedule a vote tonight on this because I wasn't certain if the mayor was going to be here and I wanted to give him an opportunity if he wasn't here tonight to address us if we had questions in July so we'll vote on this in, in July it's perfect and if you have if questions come up in the meantime or amendments let me know so okay the second uh, proposal is uh, Thank you. Uh, attachment two that uh, with the agenda that is uh, that affects several different sections of the uh, of the charter, it's it's the the uh, the subject is extending the conflict of interest to immediate family members in articles two, three, and four. And and David, if you also want to address this, yeah, this is one that um, I mean I have always assumed that the mayor. Um, just by the fact that they are the at the top of the chain of command and appoints everybody and everybody beneath it that I've always assumed that my immediate family could never work for the city like my you know daughters couldn't work for the rec department or could you know any of that so that's always how I've operated but it's not really explicitly in the charter for most conflict of interest related law it extends to the the official and their immediate family so, you know, you can't do anything that benefits you or your spouse or your children. And immediate family is pretty well defined mm -hmm. in law. Um, and so I wanted to put it explicitly in the charter for the mayor. Um, and then I was thinking we have this similar prohibition about not being a elected official and holding um, a, a, a city office. And we see lots of examples of that around us of communities that don't have those types of restrictions where you literally have like police chief who are selectmen or you have DPW directors who are on select boards and you have, you know, mostly in small towns. And it just creates, it's just so rife with all kinds of temptations and ethical issues and, um, and it just feels like we shouldn't, there's in a city of, you know, almost 30,000 people, um, you must be able to find people t to work for the city that aren't you know, married to an elected official. Um, and then in a real world example this year, um, we have two school committee members whose um, uh, spouses are school employees um, and are members of um, the un union for the school employees and have basically, um, upon the advice of the Ethics Commission, ha have had to recuse themselves from not only the budget, I mean, not only the collective bargaining, but also the budget for all intents and purposes because it's been so closely aligned with collective bargaining. So you have two members of the school committee, um, you know, representing two wards with school, with elementary schools in them who've had to basically abstain from, from all of it for months because they're married to an employee. Um, so that just made me think that if I was going to extend this to the mayor, um, I should extend, it should ex extend to all elected officials. So I'm not really sure if it's right or wrong, but it just felt like, um, and then I, there's a little footnote that just says Smith vote because they don't really, they're not really fleshed out as much as the school committee, but they do operate as a school committee. It probably should be extended to them as well. Um, because again, you're voting on the budget for the school. You're the approving authority for the employee contracts. Um, technically the employees work for you. 
Um, so to have one of those employees be a member of your immediate family is sort of um, a little bit dicey. So, Bill. Um, I actually, I, I take the point as far as the mayor and even to that extent the school committee because they're, they both have executive authorities and particularly in hiring. My concern for the council is that actually functionally eliminates the prospect of someone running for council if their if their spouse or significant other or child is working for the city in any capacity. Uh, mowing lawns for the city uh, for a summer job would disqualify someone running for council. One point, in fact, the council has absolutely no authority over that position. Doesn't even dictate uh, the the circumstances there that could actually see be in more overt conflict. So I wouldn't see the conflict that you described, the real world conflict, playing out in the council with a, re a relative working for the city in some capacity. City's one of the major employers in the city. Sure. Um, it, uh, you know, it, it just, that's my concern. While we're trying to talk about increasing and expanding prospects for, for running for office, uh, particularly for the council, um, that we're disqualifying some people uh, in some cases that, and I understand, as I said, I do understand the need for the prohibitions uh, for the two groups, the, the executive and the school committees that actually do hire people that do are associated with the contract negotiations. Uh, those conflicts are overt and should be avoided. I understand that. Yeah. That's but a fair the, point. Yeah. Just sort of throwing it all, putting it all out there, and then obviously people can expand or contract. I mean, there are a couple, there are cases where the council may. I mean, obviously, um, I have executive sessions with the city council um, to talk about collective bargaining. And obviously, if somebody was um, married to somebody who was in one of those collective bargaining units, that I wouldn't want that counselor in the executive session. But, so but, I would probably ask them to recuse but, themselves. Yeah, but that, that, that problem exists. It's the nature of executive session, regardless of whether they're married to somebody or, or what, someone speaking out, which is expressly prohibited, yeah. but if somebody's speaking out of turn about the terms of, yeah. of that's violation already. But I just mean that the problem is then, in, in those situations, I'm often then asking you to approve the funding yeah. of the contract, which then there would be a direct financial interest if you're if a counselor's immediate family member was a member of the bargaining, you know. Um, so that would just, that's just one example. Um, if those examples come up, maybe the specificity, we could focus more on the specificity yeah. of positions. Yeah. I mean, as I said, you know, a summertime job mowing lawns or somebody who's a substitute teacher who's not necessarily, so well, that would be different there. See, part. I thought about the summertime job, but then like, you know, Anne-Marie Mogio controls all the hiring of the summertime yeah. jobs. Yeah. And you're the confirming authority of the parks and rec director. So I didn't like that person because they didn't give my daughter a job. <laughs> well, that, or, uh, so I, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I think that, but again, we get stuck on this whole thing of, of you know, evil mayors and evil sure, I get it. and even yeah, that yeah. type of thing. I mean, well, I don't think we can actually we need to we, on. We, we can't have a fail safe <laughs> protection system at the same time you know the one thing that I, I'm particularly proud of this city is that it, based on my experience going to MMA conference we are the most assiduous about transparency and conflict of interest I mean other communities could care less and I I know of one community I will remain unnameless where they convene the select board convenes in one of the select board members house and two of them are related it's not <laughs> that we we are nothing like that, I and I think Darryl. there's a point at which we, 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 we are, might go to an extreme, and, and, and my concern is discouraging prospects for, for running for office in some respect. Yeah, and I have an open mind on that one. I, that one, I do acknowledge that they're slightly different and that the council isn't as directly involved in those kinds of decisions. So. And the state defines those conflicts as well. True. Those are also under state ethics laws, the conflicts are already there. Yeah. Uh, and, and, what you can and cannot do. Sam. I have two questions. One, I, I understand what you're saying about the school committee with the two school committee members this year, but what if their spouse or immediate family, family member just wasn't in the school department versus any other city department? Would there still be a conflict there? I think you could probably craft it that, that it, they could work for the city but not the school department, probably. 
Okay. Um, I guess you could probably, and I just kind of used very general language, but you could maybe say um, school department in that case. You know, immediate family member can't be an employee of the school department if people decided to adopt this. So that would allow you to work for the city uh, over which the school committee has no authority and there'd be no conflict. Um, you know, the only thing you'd have is, I mean, there's always the perception of a conflict. When an elected official's spouse works for the city, that's always like, huh, I wonder how they got that job. You know, it's like there's always, you're always going to have that perception. You know, that there's no way to get it. But that's a, there's a difference between a perception of a conflict and a real conflict, which involves financial. There has to be a financial interest. Okay. So, so that could definitely be modified to just specify school side versus city side. Um, and then the mayor one is just the mayor. I mean, the mayor can't get around it there. Yeah, that, I mean, that makes whenever. total sense. Yeah. Um, and then the other question is, is there, should there be any indication of time, like simultaneously, or like they can't hold a position within a certain amount of time of their spouse having held that position? That's a good question. I mean, there is a cooling off period yeah, for, for elected the, officials to get a job with mm -hmm. the city. I don't know whether you would craft a similar thing. I hadn't thought that far ahead. Um, whether you'd want a, a similar yeah. cooling off period for immediate family members or not, I'm not sure. You'd then have to go modify that section yeah. where it says that you have to wait a year after you, you know. I think the charter says that if you were a city employee and you ran and got elected, you are allowed to go immediately back to a city employee job. But if you weren't a city employee, then you have to wait a year um, so that it doesn't feel like you're you know, getting a job because you were an elected official. Mm -hmm. You know, again, the whole perception thing, so, yeah. Other questions for the mayor on this issue? I, I just wanted to add one more thing relative to your earlier discussion, and that is that um, when we were doing some major planning uh, work for particularly our, our bicycle and pedestrian updates and some of our downtown uh, visioning around traffic calming, we actually got a grant um, from a number of different foundations, and we worked with Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, and we did a what was called Re-Energizing Democracy Project, um, and there's actually a 34-page report that came out of it, and a lot of it was this issue of how do we reach unrepresented communities, and we did focus groups in all the public housing, um, we did surveys, we held a major forum, we met with different interest groups like Casa Latina, mm -hmm. and there's a whole report that goes through um, what happened out of that process and some of the recommendations, including you know providing childcare, right. um, which mm -hmm. you've seen we've started to do at certain meetings because that can be a major barrier um, for people and bringing meetings to people. So there, I just I wanted to acknowledge that we did go through a process and a lot of it happened coincidentally after the 2016 election where a lot of people were wanting to like re think about that re-engage and get involved and actually I will say that we I've, we've made a number of appointments to city boards from people who came to those meetings and said like you know I don't really know much about city government and I was like okay I'm gonna put you on a board and so we've actually I think since that period we've really seen a rise in um, in more underrepresented communities getting on to onto boards so Is that report accessible? Yeah, I've actually, I'm going to email it to Annie and ask her to send it to all of you. Perfect. Yeah, so you can sort of see it, and there's there's information and, and recommendations in there. So we've been trying to kind of work through those. So anyway. That, that's, that's very helpful. I, I, I just want to go back to the footnote on your... Um, yes. Uh, ...the conflict of interest. You note that Smith School trustees probably should be included in this. I do if we're trying to treat them as a school yes. committee, like, like you know, I know that there, they may have issues about it, them being created by a will, but there's actually a state law that says they are a local school board, and so they do have to follow all the same ethics rules as, as school committees. So it, it would seem if you're going to do it for one school committee, you'd want to do it for the other school district. Y yes, I agree, um, for consistency purposes. Yeah. But my question is to either you or, or to Alan, should we also consider Forbes Library trustees? Should we consider uh, the Community Preservation Committee, uh, for example, which is also under Section 5? The Community Preservation Committee doesn't hire anybody. I mean, they don't have that, that relationship with city employees. So I think that, that would be outside. Um, <coughs> Forbes Library, those are not city employees. As we have a court of law has uh, <laughs> attested to. The yes, I, I, I understand. Yeah. So um, that one, well, you, uh, yeah, the Forbes one is fraught with uh, 
challenges? <laughs> well, there are many things fraught with challenges. Yes, I know. But, <laughs> but um, do either of you think that if we if we if we're introducing this broader definition of uh, to avoid conflict of interest, should we cover Forbes Library trustees or or not? I mean, they're covered under normal conflict of interest laws. That was actually right. one thing we stipulated in our in our little legal matter that we had that they would abide by all of those. So they do have to abide by those. The question would be if somebody wanted to if they wanted to hire a family member. I don't know what the rules are for that. Well, they wouldn't be able. To, I mean, no trustee is going to participate in the hiring of their own family member, and unless that position is classified as a special municipal employee. Remember that whole conversation we had about special municipal employees? That they can't hold the contract in the same department. So what special municipal employee status would allow would be an employee going to a different department than their relative is, you know, is, um, so I mean, I'd have to think about this because they are really truly a hybrid and, and I'm not mm -hmm. jumping back into the Forbes library morass um, without some real thought about that. You want to be on solid ground before you jump back into that morass. Well, that's true, but you know, uh, one, one thing I want to look at is that the state law allows cities and towns to make more um, uh, restrictive laws, conflict of interest laws, than the state law. But does that mean that we can also make it for those who are, are not city employees, but who are ultimately overseen by those who are elected at the city election. This is why mm -hmm. these kinds of hybrids are really difficult. Which is very I difficult. understand. So I'm not really sure. I'm not going to offer an opinion that, that we have the authority to control in that, to, to create more restrictive conflict rules for Forbes employees who are not city employees. I'm not prepared to make that. No, decision. you're not prepared, but you can you can do some thinking about it. I will and absolutely at a, do at a future meeting you can offer yeah. us your, your absolutely your very valuable opinion. Yes, Bill. So I wanna ask Alan, do, do you do you think that the current city laws about conflict of uh, the state laws about conflict of interest uh, fall short on these uh, distinctions? I mean or I mean, I think a lot of the language cover, at least from what I understand, covers any over conflicts regardless of, uh, of covers whether it's in the charter or not. This is certainly more restrictive than state law. And um, I think you're asking more of a political question than a legal question. Um, you know, what is the, the, the appropriate standard that should be applied here? I can tell you that there is no absolute prohibition to you know, f family members of city employees holding positions in certain situations with certain exemptions, with certain findings. You know, we've been through all of right. this. This is an absolute prohibition, and it's it's more stringent and it's more restrictive. And the question is to whether we need more restrictive um, conflict rules. I'm not sure that's really a legal question. I mean, that's what this. Okay, but I, I just think the, I mean, Massachusetts actually has defined itself uh, as being fairly, uh, really restrictive, uh, really restrictive and aggressive really restrictive. on these conflicts, and in conflicts as they present, uh, can be adjudicated, and that and and the, uh, I, the ultimate authority assumes the attorney general, but the um, no, it's the state ethics commission. Oh, okay. So so if the state ethics commission finds. A conflict and a violation that that they, they've never been too shy about expressing that. I mean, no, that, that, and so you know, so for what the mayor describes, and I understand why this might have inspired the the two circumstances. Is essentially, you have two school committee members rendered moot. Um, they they do are not serving their constituents because they have to recuse themselves from a significant portion of what they've been asked to do in their office, um, that could be addressed by the voters and one, I mean, they have recused themselves and in, in good conscience. And at the same time, um, if, if their constituents feel they're being underserved, there's an opportunity to address that at the polls. So I, I'm just saying, I, I'm, I'm still trying to suss this out and trying to determine the other needs because I can see, I, I, I mean, I, I, 
there's not a lot of flexibility built into uh, uh, state law, and this this eliminates any flexibility. And that, as we discovered, because to get the special status, actually, we need to do in order to actually populate boards, because functionally, we're eliminating a lot of prospects who might otherwise provide um, helpful service. So I, I that's. I'm still working out my ambivalence. I was just wondering if you had. Yeah, no, I mean, I guess the, the differing views are, well, we're trying to eliminate the, the, the possibility of abuse where, you know, counselors, all their kids are working, and, you right. know, and to the exclusion of, of all of these other groups of people who may be in even more needing of these jobs. And, you know, you get these jobs through connections. Well, this will certainly eliminate that. The other the other argument is this may sound like a, a, a solution in search of a problem, but I mean I know there has been a history of oh, yeah. government employees yeah, having yeah. their kids mowing lawns and having their kids do every every you know. A, a, and this community is not exclusive. Oh, <laughs> not and, and, I, and I've lived in a number of communities where where patronage right. jobs were commonplace, and it was actually how you know it's it's how Massachusetts government functioned. And consequently, state law did what it could to try and eliminate those kind of structures. Historically, you know, the Michael Curley days of, 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 of governance and how it's done. And I think this is actually, at this point, almost a, a solution in search of a problem. Um, because I, I agree, there is an opportunity for uh, rank corruption and exploitation of, of uh, people in power you don't see that anymore you don't see anyone just collecting a check wearing an orange vest for and no one can even give them a job description they're related to so and so yeah. those days that's not happens. the I don't think that's the problem that's being addressed here, or, or addressed here mm -hmm. I think the problem is you know all of the lawnmowers being related to city employees and they got their jobs because you know they had an in well it's city employee could still hire them i mean that's uh, relatives of city employees could certainly still hire them yeah. um yeah i once had a job at the state house because uh, a senator wanted to appeal to my dad i had no qualification to do that and i wrote the definitive uh analysis of nuclear fission and fusion for the legislators at the time of Three Mile Island, and I didn't even have a high school diploma. So again, if you guys want to have trouble sleeping at night, that's <laughs> <laughs> but the, that that particularly in this level doesn't. That's not the type of thing that happens anymore. I just want to be clear: like the conflict of interest, the reason why it's extended to immediate family generally is that you know, you know, you, all the generally speaking, the money is all in one household, one family. Right. So, like, you know, if your wife gets a job, then you're kind of benefiting because, you know, that right. or your husband gets a job, it's affecting your overall household income. So that's why they treat it like a household. So that's that's the other key part of that is that there is a financial benefit if you, by status of your being elected official, you can get some job, then, you know, that's going to benefit. But I realize it's not, it's not rampant. And it right. may be mm -hmm. certainly not on the city council side. And I'm not saying that that the people that work for the school department, you know, got their jobs because of it. In most cases, their spouses were already employees and then they ran for office. That's, that's exactly um, right. I mean, in so those circumstances, yeah. that's the case is people yeah. who actually have a vested interest in the discussion yeah. run for school committee positions. But it doesn't sometimes. negate the fact that there is a financial interest yeah. if you're voting on the budget or a contract. For and, and theoretically, that conflict should be sussed out by the, the process of a campaign, but. True. Yeah. Bill, would you feel that this is less of a, uh, a solution in search of a problem if the mayor had come forward just addressing this for the executive branch? I, I, no, not necessarily. I actually, again, I'm not sure this level of, this granular level is necessary for the charter. I, I'm open for convincing. But in fact, in policy, establishing policy, but it, when it comes down to election of elected officials, I suppose it has to be embedded in the charter if we're going to talk about elected officials as opposed to policy. I mean, the executive could simply say, we will not hire anybody who's related to any elected official. That's a disqualification for employment. Or leave it up to the discretion of the, the mayor uh, based on 
where they they may have to make the case where where the conflict exists. I mean, the council doesn't hire anyone, so it would be up to the two executive systems, the school committee and the, and the mayor, who might have a policy, a very clear policy about hiring that's that might create this perception of conflict. I, putting it in the charter so much, it, it does, it seems more draconian than, and it is, as, as the city solicitor says, it's pretty absolute. There's no wiggle room. And, and I'm glad we have what we do have in the charter, because I wouldn't want yeah. to see no, no. W directors being on the city council or, you know, the police chief right. as, as a city councilor. So I just think that's I agree. completely inappropriate. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, so I'm glad we have what we have. So I just was, yeah. Okay, I'll sit down and let you guys. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as, as the mayor's position evolved, the mayor used to be a part-time mayor. They used to have to have a, another compensated position. And it has evolved to the point where it makes perfect sense that they don't. It also makes perfect sense, I believe, the counselors can't have an, uh, if they didn't have another compensated position, they would starve. But um, <laughs> but we are part-time members, and this is uh, uh, holding it holding us to the same standard. Seems uh, also given the fact that we don't have the oversight as defined by this very document, um, seems a, little, a, a bridge too far. Other thoughts, Bob. My concern is about the school committee. So much of our conversation in here has been trying to encourage people to stand for elected positions. If I read this, it looks like a whole lot of folks are going to be prohibited from running for school committee if we go this way. Any, any relative of a teacher? Son, daughter, husband, partner? And that's a lot of people. And we got vacancies on the school committee now? Is the is the is the cure worse than disease on this? And what does the school committee do aside from voting on a budget or engaging in collective bargaining? Are there other duties that we want them to do, even if they can't vote on a budget? I mean, they sp they speak to policy for that runs the school department. What's well, so a significant portion of their job description. Yeah. Yeah. Sam? That I was just going to say the same thing. Like, it, it's a big part of what they do, and it's been very apparent having two absent this go around. Um. Well, I think Bob's point is well taken, however, that the, that the cure may be worse than the disease. Uh, we would be eliminating a significant number of people in the city from running for school committee because of the number of school department employees there are. And the, uh, I don't believe there's a vacancy currently on the school committee. I think what was said is that there's someone, that there's a ward where there's yet no candidate for school committee. However, it's my observation that um, over recent decades, there's been very little um, you know, uh, there, there there aren't a lot of candidates for school committee. Certainly, the the most knowledgeable, informed, engaged, <laughs> interested candidates would be relatives. Other thoughts? Okay. Well, um, we've heard uh, a number of concerns raised. Uh, uh, about specifically about uh, city council extending this to the city council and to the school committee uh, one question is whether um, it should if it applies to the school committee it should only apply to relatives working for the school department uh, there was a question about whether there should be a cooling off period um, uh, and if, if, if that's the case, then, you know, we need to determine what, what that cooling off period should be. So I think there's more work that needs to be done on this question. Is there, is there uh, uh, David, is there any, anything you've heard tonight that, that you feel you would want to sort of amend your, your proposals? Or? Yeah, I, I was starting with obviously the most, you know, 
the most deadly cure, I guess, <laughs> or whatever. The, uh, I, 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 so I was starting with all the um, all the elected offices that had the, <coughs> that had the provision already in place that you couldn't hold a position, and I was just expanding it to their immediate family. Yeah. But obviously, you know, there is that concern. Um, I mean, the school committee has basically three duties since Ed reform. One is to hire and supervise the superintendent. One is to set policy for the district, overarching policy. And then the third is the budget. Those are sort of the three main duties. Um, the day-to-day -day running of schools, picking out books, hiring and firing teachers, all that's been taken away from school committees, thank goodness. Um, and that's all delegated to building principals. Um, so they, really, those are the three overarching jobs. So, but, but again, I'm, I don't want to wasn't my intention to disqualify people um, who work for the schools necessarily, but again, it's going to be hard to get around one of the most, one, I mean, what drives policy is the budget. You know, if you're going to, if you're going to have a language immersion program, you're going to have to vote on a budget to fund it. So it's like the budget is always the 800 pound gorilla in the room for everything. Um, so that, that's, it's hard to separate those, but I mean, we've, we've kind of gone along and there've always been issues where there've been, um, you know, Jim Dostal's wife was a longtime school right. teacher, and um, there's ways to kind of work around it and segregate things, and we can try to do it. Just it felt really pronounced this time around to have two school committee members, um, you know, the representative for Ryan Road School and the representative for Bridge Street School, who had to recuse themselves from everything um, for good reason, mm -hmm. but but still, it was just it was a, it set up a strange situation um, that could have affected a close vote it could have affected a lot of different things so but it, it, it didn't but still so so I'm open I just I wanted to throw this out here more as a reaction to having gone through that and it may be that it is an overreaction and we don't need to we don't need to go that far and okay you can just do the mayor I mean you can just put put it in the I mean I think it's implicit for the mayor but it's not really clear to me um, because really, pretty much, the mayor appoints every department head, so it's impossible to think that a s child of a mayor could work or a right. spouse could work for any department. That would be that there wouldn't be a conflict. What about, for instance, one of your daughters wanted to intern in your office? Um, will we they never wanted to intern. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> that's true. I'm not offering a real world scenario yeah, in that yeah. respect, but I mean, suppose someone's child wants to intern in their office. Yeah. I mean, that's not a compensated. I guess if it was so. an unpaid internship, you could do that. Yeah. I suppose. Again, it still would maybe be a perception of a conflict. Of, well, you know, I, I think the perception would be obvious, but it also I think a lot of people don't understand that that um, you know there's there's they don't influence policy. They don't yeah. have effect on on yeah. on decisions. They're there to help and doing research and things like that and all the other mundane things that go with being an intern and not being paid. Um, I just wouldn't want to. I mean, I think that again would be. Yeah, but it does say compensated city position. So okay. unless it was Fair a enough. paid yep. internship, right. then it wouldn't really affect right. it. But yeah. So. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank All you. right. We'll continue our discussion of this during the summer. Okay. Next uh, item is. Um, to continue our discussion about possibly removing the designation candidate for re-election from the names of incumbents on municipal election ballots. We began this discussion at our last meeting, so I think we need a motion to take this off the table to continue discussion. So moved. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Uh, Sam, do you want to pick up on, the, on this at this point? Um. Well, I think we, we did establish that this is stated in Mass General Law. Mm -hmm. um, and there was some hesitation because we, I think it, the hesitation was that we were recommending that the clerk do something that goes against the law, but I just want to reiterate that a lot of the things we've recommended goes against Mass General Law, so. Or, <laughs> I mean, or, we are asking, well, we're asking for permission to change it for us, it was my point. It, it, it's either, going against the current standards set in, in Mass General Law or not addressed in Mass General Law. Right. Right. But I, and I think that the context is that, that, that it's not something the clerk could do without our recommending a, a, a change in the, in the charter, which would you know, go through the entire process. Correct. Okay. 
Further discussion? I, I, Alan, you, you missed that conversation last time. I did. Um, I, I, for one, am perfectly in favor. I think this is a silly anachronistic tale that's basically mm -hmm. existing, but the fact is, is that elect Massachusetts election law actually has already got it in in their definitions of how ballot will be structured. Right. Is this something that would make sense for us to solicit the legislature, the Secretary of State, about whether we can actually eliminate the candidate for re-election designation on the ballot? Well, um, I don't know if you're asking whether you, we should contact the Secretary of State's office to see whether they would support a request for us for a special act, but understand the, a special act overrides this general law. We're asking the state legislature to override general law for our local elections and allow our local elections to be done in a different way. The legislature has every authority to do that. The political question is whether they're going to hear from, you know, Secretary of State Galvin saying, no, don't do this. This is a bad idea for whatever reason. Um, I don't know what Galvin's position on this is or would be, um, but the legislature has every authority to authorize us to print our municipal ballots without a candidate for re-election being shown on there. Uh, because the special act trumps, special trumps general. Okay? And that's why we're asking for a special act. In the same way, we're asking to, to lower the voting age to 18. Lower voting age. You know, the ranked choice voting, all of that is varying state law, and we're asking for permission to do that through special legislation. So that's the Sam's point. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Is there a, uh, a motion to recommend this change? Uh, I'll move that recommendation to change. The designation candidate for re-election to remove candidate from re for re-election from the names of incumbents on municipal ballots. Second. Further discussion? Roll call, please, Annie. Stan Moulton. Yes. Sam Hopper. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Darby Sullivan. Yes. Molly Fox. Yes. Patty Healy. Yes. Bob Boris. Yes. Lynn Simmons. Yes. Sorry, I switched. That's good job. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> It's keeping me on my toes over here, Annie. <laughs> okay, that's approved unanimously. Thank you. Okay, now um, we want to get back to our discussion about underrepresented communities. And Molly, you had you had some material you were going to share with us. Well, yes, it's also almost nine. I mean, do people have this sort of energy and and will to? engage in what is not a quick conversation? It, uh, the answer, well, from my perspective, yes, we do. We're not meeting again until July 20th, we're, so, uh, or July 18th, rather. So, uh, and, and so I had anticipated that we would go a little longer tonight. Okay. So, um, I'm actually pretty excited that Mayor Narkowitz mentioned that there is this report, which I feel will be beneficial to draw on. So that, I think, should be part of the discussion once it becomes available. Um, just by way of a bit of background in my professional role um, as director of an initiative at Bay Path University where under the graduate program of leadership and negotiation, I work with community organizations that serve women who are low income. Um, to offer negotiation training. A lot of my role is very much around equity and inclusion, so I think about this quite a bit. Um, and we are in a position um, all the time as organizations to think about, it's the constantly how to get, uh, engage um, um, communities with direct and, live direct and lived experiences and, and affected populations. Um, so I imagine the recommendations that came out of the report um, will be really useful and probably will dovetail very well with some of the suggestions um, that I have. But um, as part of the notes that I prepared and thinking about this, I think it's important for us to consider that 
you know, one of the impacts of systemic racialization is the exclusion of people of color from many avenues of decision making, so civic part participation and power. Um, people of color, the most direct stakeholders in the elimination of racism, um, and those with the most firsthand experience with its effects must have a role in strategic efforts along with whites. So we really need to be thinking about striving to engage stakeholders who have active and authentic connections to their respective communities. And it's important to ensure meaningful participation, voice, and ownership. The ideal is the sooner that we can engage a diverse mix of stakeholders, the sooner we will be able to move from talk to action and creating equitable opportunities for the communities that we're seeking to serve. And I just want to highlight that there is really a difference between stakeholder engagement and empowerment. As I mentioned earlier, engagement may simply involve getting input or limited participation, and empowerment really involves taking leadership, making decisions, designing solutions and strategies at every phase of the strategic effort. Capacity building and efforts that are led by people of color and focused on building power in effective communities can be a particularly important strategy. Um, so one thing that we do as an organization when we have these conversations about inclusion and equity is we make sure that we are establishing a shared understanding of some of the terminology because sometimes we use these terms in different ways and we not everybody is on the same page um, with what they mean. And um, I had made a couple of handouts for folks so that we were all on the same page around terminology and I can share it with Annie and we can sort of distribute it afterward. Um, but if you would like um, to just sort of pass around now, you're very welcome um, to, I think it's sort of important as a piece of the conversation. Um, and I think we really need to think about, as a committee, the ways in which we are um, practicing institutional racism. The, one of the articles that I picked up that I really liked, and I sort of, maybe it would be worthwhile just to kind of read their 10 points and we can think as kind of a group here to what extent we really identify with this and how seriously we really want to engage on this topic because it's not just, again, as I said, a quick fix. Would people be interested in me sharing some of these? Yes, please. It's a little bit pithy. Um, the article is written um, by uh, Co uh, Cobert Mosley. It's off of the um, fantastic resource um, Dr. Works books. Uh, around racial equity, and it's titled 10 Ways to Practice Institutional Racism at Your Nonprofit. One, maintain white leadership. Ensure that white people, even in institutions that serve primarily people of color, predominantly occupy your board leadership and executive management positions. This is going to require you to come up with some really excellent excuses to mask institutional racism. One, they have to be qualified. Two, we can't find qualified candidates. Three, they need to meet the minimum qualifications. Four, team culture is important here. Five, we just don't know any people of color. Six, we have good qualified white people that should be promoted. Seven, we ask a black person once and we never got any applications. Point two, frame the issues and lead the strategies for people of color. Ensure that white people, even in institutions that serve primarily populations of color, predominantly frame the social issues and lead the strategies to impact social problems. Invest in mostly white, nonprofit leadership to receive the training and resources needed to pursue their strategies and ideas. Make value statements that minimize the strategies created by people directly affected by the issues. And do not invest in the strategies about your programs. People of color will request an opportunity for feedback on programs or service design, implementation, and evaluation. Limit this feedback to a survey and do not come back to share it. Share if that information was used in any way. Four, ignore complaints of bias and racism from workers and clients. Ignore microaggressions and micro inequities, social workers of color experienced by their white social work colleagues. Five, value credentials versus the skills needed to serve diverse populations. Carefully select employment criteria and credentialing requirements and do not require demonstration of the knowledge and skills required to effectively serve a culturally and linguistically diverse service population. In addition, you can diversify your lowest paid workers that usually provide direct service to ensure you have some diversity in your staff. Do not involve people directly impacted. 
do not involve people directly impacted into the planning, implementation, and evaluation of services at your organization. This will maintain a dependency on the services you provide and ensure that people of color don't receive the training, resources, and opportunity to learn the skills to address social issues in their own communities. Whitewash the diversity language. Minimize the critique of institutional racism by expanding the definition of diversity to include other forms of diversity, like gender, sexual orientation, occupation, background, socioeconomic status, and geography. Maintain the social dynamic of white nonprofit affinity groups. Don't participate in social initiatives predominantly led by people of color. Focus on social events where you can share resources between other predominantly white-led organizations and increase your fundraising revenue, et cetera. Ex this one doesn't really apply to us, but it's talking about exploiting black clients and poverty um, by showcasing the most disadvantaged, heartbreaking stories of your clients you served and how you helped them. 10, check your cult cultural competency training box. Include cultural competency training for your staff. There are many white people that provide this training to have the appearance of wanting to address equity, learn, le learn the language to have better conversations about race. Um, and then it got cut off. and equity, but do not create an action plan that would ensure equity and empowerment with your organization. He writes, I realize that institutional racism may not be your goal or intention. You may not even be aware of the complexities of racism at your organization. I hope this post moves you from unintentional racism to intentional allyship. Food for thought. <laughs> So I'd be very interested in looking at the study that was done, I don't know how many years ago, because it sounds like some of the things that I would personally have suggested have been done, but we don't know if the outcomes or the, re the recommendations were ever followed. And also if you should do a follow-up of um, a similar Sort of outreach to communities. One group, I, I, not to move from this at all, but one group that approached me was the uh, members of the Pioneer Valley Workers Center, some and immigrants mm. who um, I, inv I explained and invited them to the, our initial forum about um, elections and you know, when, that we did in April, I guess it was. And there was a lot of interest, and people were. Were there were a few people who said, "Well, we'd like to come and talk about um, immigrant rights in the city," but they didn't come, and I didn't go back and ask why. But this discussion now makes me think that I should be going back and talking to people and sitting down and maybe with someone else and talk about what the issues are for um, immigrants in the city and how they see the structure of the city. Um, and the governance of the city, either supporting them and engaging them and, or not. Um, but it's easy for me to be um, a very privileged white person with a job who, and lots of benefits and to not follow through with that very quickly. So um, I will do that. <laughs> but I would like to see this study as well because- You're, you're uh, referring to this, the, the, what the mayor spoke to mm -hmm. earlier, and I, that was done fairly recently. Oh, only a year, so. And it sounds like they, you know, it was a very methodical approach with best practices, mm -hmm. um, and a lot, a lot of the content that I have here is adapted from the seven-step guide, which was published by the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and many, many organizations that do this work around equity and inclusion draw from that research. Mm -hmm. um, but there are definitely questions that can you know, that we can think about um, that can help sort of ensure that the Charter Review has a, you know, a powerful mix of stakeholders. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one is who is, most, who is most adversely affected by the issues that are being addressed. We really need to sort of be thinking mm -hmm. about that piece. Who mm -hmm. faces racial barriers or biases or exclusions from power related to these issues specifically? Um, how are people of different racial groups differently situated or affected by these inequities? And this is where a lot of people doing this work, they just sort of get exhausted thinking about the level, the depth and breadth of the research and data required. But if you're really serious about looking at these pieces, you're looking, you're collecting 
the data and you are disaggregating the data based on, okay, which communities are affected, as they're saying, mostly adversely by poverty, by housing, by whatever the issue happens to be, and then it's a, it becomes a different conversation. Um, ideally, what would racial composition of this, you know, committee look like in an ideal world? What would that composition look like on city council um, is a question that we could be thinking about. Uh, in what ways are stakeholders most affected by inequities already involved in addressing it? So this piece really speaks to, I think, some of the, the report that Mayor Narkowitz talked about. It sounds like people got involved in this participation. And one thing that is really, really common for these communities who have experienced disenfranchisement is that, you know, there will be some committee, there will be some organization, there will be some good intentioned but ill informed, you know, organization that will come in, parachute in, mm -hmm. really want, you know, the this, you know, the input and then be gone. And as you can imagine, that doesn't it doesn't does very little to build trust and do the necessary relationship building that fosters inclusion in these kinds of um, you know, committees or organizations or whether it's running for city council, et cetera. So I think one question is what has been done before and how can these efforts that are already existing be supported and expanded and integrated into what we're doing here? So again, it'll be interesting to sort of hear what people are needing, what people are wanting, what gets them engaged, whether it's food, whether it's childcare, whether it's hosting meetings like these not at hours that are specifically conducive to people who work nine, you know, nine to five professional jobs or, or stay at home. Um, what are ways that uh, stakeholders adversely affected can be further engaged? We're looking at that. How can diverse communities and leaders be engaged from the outset so that they have a real opportunity to shape the solutions and strategies? How can community engagement be inclusive, representative, and authentic? How will stakeholders exercise real leadership and power? who can be allies and supporters and how can they be engaged, um, who needs to be recruited or invited to join the effort to address the issue, who will approach them, how, what, um, what will they be asked to do to get, to get involved. So it's a lot and it's yes. general at this point. Um, there's quite a bit involved in this process. Yes, but, but I think uh, we, can, we can use the report from the mayor's office as the, the basis for beginning to understand what efforts have been made already, yeah. what inroads have been made. Uh, it's likely that we'll have to, to, to go to some of these communities. And uh, it will be, you know, again, potentially another primarily white or white presenting group going into a group for, you know, limited time and, you know, I think it, it's going to require um, from this group some level of investment, interest and curiosity to come in with a level of cultural competency, you know, that they may, folks here may not have felt like they necessarily signed up for, but that's part of what this work is. Um, so I think folks sort of need, there needs to be buy-in, um, and that's partly why we talk about sort of establishing a shared understanding up front um, initially around some of these things in order for this to actually be responsive and for us to be effective at this. Observations from other, Bill? I think, despite what Patty had said, actually, the, we cannot exclude the, the notion of class and classism. I mean, uh, that also cuts across. There's a Venn diagram with overlap, of course. But it's the, it is the one bias that's rarely talked about and, and or less so and actually informs a lot. It also gets to the same, similar root problems of representation, outreach, contact, communication, empathy, uh, all the, I mean, a phenomenon that occurs in this city over and over again is um, people, earnest, good, thoughtful people speaking about them without them, as it were. You know, speaking about people mm. representing a community that they're not in, but they, they have some etic perspective that they're offering, but at the same time at the exclusion of the voices that they supposedly represent. Not intentionally, 
And I think this is actually what Molly was suggesting is, I mean, this is, you know, um, this kind of altruism, you know, the whole aspect of white supremacy is that you are in a position where you can bestow upon people these virtues, so these, these, these benefits, right? Mm -hmm. That these are gifts from us. And that's the attitude that needs to be sh shook up. But at the same time, the nature of disempowerment is it's self-propagating. It, um, and it is reinforced by the group that is empowered. And at the same time, the disempowered become more isolated and less capable of vesting or, or more, certainly more skeptical, skeptical about participating and getting engaged. But that actually, in, in, but that includes an issue of class. And um, we demographically are predominantly identified as white. And, um, and structurally, our communities, in a strange way, different from a lot of other cities insofar as our communities of color or other or minority cultures are isolated in pockets in the periphery not so much concentrated downtown. The downtown actually is a, is a wealthy neighborhood. And so outreach, there, there's, and this is the whole thing that uh, Casa Latina and before that Necessities and Necessidades was talking about is that there, there are a dynamic, whole, wholesome communities that are not, f do not feel in any way connected to this community. And um, so I, 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 I agree, this is a deeper dive. Mm. And, and, and what's important is how we figure out how to bring it back into how, you know, what part of the structure of the, the charter actually um, prevents participation, which d reinforces the white supremacy, which reinforces the exclusionary aspects. This reinforces what, the status quo. <coughs> right, but the, the status quo actually is defined as a structure of government, strong mayor, weak council, things like that. If, if there is a suggestion of actually changing that, that probably doesn't come up during this charter review, <laughs> given the amount of time we have left. And if, it, if, it's, if it's a bigger, more structural, change that we can't that we're actually as you're suggesting we're not entitled to make that de de uh, determination no so. I, i'm not the expert i'm yeah. just no, no. passing well, on promise. this you know information the one thing bill if i may just sort of say um on the class piece and the sort of other ism piece as part of this conversation I think it's, we definitely need to look at the sort of makeup of our community and the community that we serve. Who are these people that are most impacted by these decisions that we are making? Um, and then there's another piece, which is, you know, in the US, race is the major fault line um, in America. So I think we can use other isms as a way to sort of distance and detour and get away, and in fact, I brought a piece on that as well, because that is usually the first thing that kind of comes up in these conversations is some version of, we can't forget about these other pieces here. Um, and there's a little bit, I mean, it's just food for thought, but there's a little, there's a sort of like, a little bit of all lives matters-ishness. No, no, and, and don't, Misunderstand yeah. me in any respect in that way. No, I'm not. I'm not saying that. I, unfortunately, what happens though is um, in this community, we are, attach ourselves to the defense of of racial minorities and and at the, and without discussing class issues. And within those structures, class issues also come up too. Within, within those communities. And the fact is, is if we want to talk about representation class, it's not about all lives matter. It's, I'm just saying that there are, there are whole classes or however we define those. I mean, it's interesting. We're using both the term class and racism. Racism actually is not an official, I mean, race. Racism, is, is but not, as a racism political is, it's concept. A political desert, and they're both in both cases, same thing. I mean, we're supposedly a classless society, but we all know when we're referring to lower middle class that were upper class that there are 
class distinctions and empowerment is also defined by class. It's just that I think they're, they are, uh, they are inextricably linked, not at the exclusion of one or the other, it's that they're inextricably linked. And I think that, that there are a lot of people who are defined as different classes other than the power, empowered class that are actually functionally eliminated by the same way, by the same mechanisms that actually deny access for other groups. No question. I mean, I, certainly if you're advocating for sort of an intersectional approach, um, then yes, which is in the way in which multiple identities work together to you know, oppress. So a woman of color who is poor, for example, is experiencing all those different categories of oppression very differently. So it becomes relevant to sort of be thinking about all of those things. Um, as long as you're not, as long as we're just sort of staying on the same page, but not I think being mutually exclusive, no. right? Yeah. So, but we could easily make this like an intellectual thing and have a whole conversation about it. I think the let's get back to the data piece because this is where be, the data becomes important. Where the Charter Review Committee for the City of Northampton, equity is about outcomes. We really need to be understanding the populations that we are actually serving, and that should be dictating who you know what and how and the methods and whether it's class or whether it's you know very specific to um, the way in which people identify their racial background or wh whatever it is will be determined by those most impacted um, and I that is sort of lacking in the conversation I think um, thus far because we don't have a total understanding of who those populations are and it's actually quite hard to dig into that data from a census perspective and get it broken um, down and that's why most people don't eat, want to just do the work because it's hard. Other thoughts? Okay. Uh, I believe that um, Annie will probably send to us later this week the this report uh, that the mayor has referred to. And maybe we can include the background so we're sort of yes. all on the same page here. Yes, that would be that would be very helpful. Uh, I would suggest then that we continue this discussion and devote a, a good amount of time at our July 18th meeting to furthering our, our efforts to come up with a, 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 a plan of engagement and understanding the populations uh, that, that Molly refers to that we should be reaching out to engage. I'm not even sure. I mean, we have to almost engage to be talking about the plan itself. That's the, you know, well, it's the chicken or egg kind of a thing. Then we should, I mean, who do you, uh, um, Patty, you mentioned that you've talked to people from the Pioneer Valley Workers Center. You will uh, go back to them yes, and certainly invite uh, uh, one or more of, uh, people to come t to that meeting. I think, I think what I I'll do is a little bit different. I think yeah. what I'll do is, I, I mean, I, I'm active to some degree in the, the center. So yeah. I, I think I'll go back to the people who were, had expressed an interest and just convene a group to say, what do you see in the city? And how do you see the, you know, democracy and your part in it in, lo, in our local city? And, would you, and then if there's a, some interest in discussion and um, then, then I would perhaps like, take a next step I would certainly tell people to come and but I think I invite think people to, to be, come yes I mean to to engage um, we're going to need to I think yeah. to make the those personal connections mm -hmm. Molly mm -hmm. you, you were you had a thought about that. um I mean I'll just I'll say um, it's not about having communities that are underrepresented doing the work to educate us so that's mindset switch a um, it's on us to educate ourselves about what the communities need so what a, whether that means going to the communities becoming a part of their social events etc not inviting them to participate in ours and expecting mm -hmm. them yeah. to enlighten us um, so I think it's also understanding quite a bit. I mean, it sounds like you have this background with this community. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't recommend folks going into communities where they don't already have a sense of what has happened with these communities before and how that's gone, or at least that's where the conversation be you know, begins. Um, how has this gone before when other communities, other organizations, other committees have reached out to you, um, interested in you engaging in some way, like how has that gone for you? I, you know, it may, in all likelihood, it probably hasn't gone well. Um, so it's kind of acknowledging that and 
being clear, like how are we going to do that differently? Um, because what we can get really wrong here, Stan, is repeating the same thing over and over and over and over again and just reinforcing um, and perpetuating a way of engaging folks that actually contributes to them not wanting to engage in the future. I, I, I understand that, and I, I agree that we will need to do that work ourselves. My only suggestion is that I'm, I'm happy to hear from anyone who can help inform us about the path that we are setting out on. Right, and it just, all it worse, I think I'm saying is just it may require taking on that initiative and, you know, going out to the communities themselves and not expecting folks to sort of accommodate our schedule and this, that, and the other. And then being very honest about with the communities, you know, I'm reaching out to you because you have specific insights and specific brilliance on this specific topic that we are interested in solving. So that also sort of means that we need to be clear on what we want their engagement around. Um, I just think yes. some of this work and has been done, and I would really yeah, think exactly. we just have to like get sort of start the there start before there. we reach out. That would be, and I know again, there's this urgency to sort of, you know, can I make maybe yeah. I mean a proposal? But I mean, we haven't talked about this at all except sitting here tonight. Yeah. But it sounds like you and I have a particular interest in this. It's, just, it's what I do. Yeah, and but maybe we'll all have that information and data we can all look at it and we maybe should have an, a, another conversation outside of i mean tonight it's late yeah i, I would like i would really I, th I feel that i would have a lot more ability to sort of understand how this data relates to the charter and how the mm. how, you know i i just feel like i'm without information yeah so I think maybe if we could do that, maybe we could meet and anyone else who would like to meet, coffee clatch, I mean, and just. It's probably not a, like a subcommittee yeah. of the committee is <laughs> it's not the worst yes. idea. Yes. Sam? Sorry, so Sam. I, I just want to point out that one, like time is of the essence here. So there is a sense of urgency. If we're going to do this, I think we need to act. We have July and August only has one meeting, so we can't actually meet for coffee outside of this as the Charter Review Committee. Oh, yeah, you're right. It, we're, Sorry. Yeah, oh, right. Let me, so there's open meeting law. Yeah. Can I just clarify? Yeah. Yes, Alan. You could certainly um, form a, we, th this committee could form a subcommittee, and you could post your meetings and meet. Okay. I mean, as long as it's you just can't, public. you're just going to have right. to post oh. meetings the way you post these meetings. Okay. Right. And they're going to be open to the public. But that, that would be great. On the same <laughs> note, though, time is of the essence. Yeah. We have an expiration date, and this conversation right. has been tabled three times. So I just, I understand what you're trying to say, but I also understand when Stan is saying we need to be actively doing this sooner rather than later. Because if we're not able to get anything together until the fall. But I think this is what that looks like, Sam. I mean, we may need to redefine what action looks like given the timetable. I mean, this is just the dilemma that ever it's not like this is the first time this has happened in terms of. But if we're doing it for the Charter Review Committee, we have a deadline. Everyone has a deadline. I'm not disagreeing. I mean, I'm not disagreeing with you, but there's always a deadline. There's always something pressing. I'm just saying we may need to manage expectations around what achievement will look like here. Um, it seems like folks really that will look like having certain people as part of this conversation on this date and be doing these things. So I think it just may require conversation. You know, what are we hoping to be able to achieve? But, in the time and that's now? actually what I was hoping for is yeah. a, a, a much more clear understanding of what the outcome is expected to be of this and and the fact that we need to act on it. Robbie. Along that vein, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm just not clear as to whether we are trying to involve people right away to speak to issues that we're covering in the charter, mm -hmm. or if we are actually looking to change the language of the charter based on what we learn. Uh, that's not actually clear to me where we're going with this, because it, it's huge. And yes, it's necessary. But as far as our parameters, I'm not really clear on what we're trying to do here. Me either. <laughs> uh, so I think, can I just win. chime in then? Yeah. So I think the, I see the next step being we look at the PVPC report that the mayor mentioned mm -hmm. and we all read it before the next meeting and the bulk of that meeting is focused on what, what our outcome should be and how do we go, how do we get there? communities are identified in that report then that's 
I think, where we would go. Um, however we go, whether we hold a meeting or multiple meetings or um, have a specific outreach to, you know, a representative or a tenant association or something. But I think we're all spinning on the same thing right now, and until we see that report, we won't really know what that is until July. The, you know, the groups, uh, some of the groups that have been uh, families with power, um, Mary Cowie and Kim Gerald, along with uh, residents of Hampshire Heights, have been a, an empowerment group within Jackson Street School District, and basically, there's also Casa Latina, which is actually a shadow of its former self. Um, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Pioneer Valley Workers actually has been the most active and engaged, in fact, actually, as far as the, the Trust Act, the uh, issues surrounding security cameras and other things like that, brought members of the community uh, advocating and participating in the discussion and debate about uh, several issues that have been before us in the council. But these are groups that have normally, by and large, have not been engaged in, pro in, in issues unless they uh, have a direct affiliation with the city or there's been an affront. And I think reaching out to them is a start. Yeah. There are tenant agent, there are tenant groups in, in subsidized housing. There's, uh, I think they would argue they're not all that empowered. But they are advocates, and they have been, and they are engaged, particularly on issues di that directly affect them in their housing. Um, and I mean, those are access points. They're not. They're not the, you know, as, as opposed to us speculating, and guessing. Um, and I, and I think the pa Pioneer Valley Workers is actually because a great group because there's the breadth of of. Uh, undocumented immigrants, there's uh, residents at risk in all sorts of levels, including particularly in jobs, um, and they're pretty well organized. Mm -hmm. But I, I, part of the mm -hmm. challenge is actually I mean, almost virtually every agency except for Casa Latina that I mentioned is all headed by white folks. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. Stanley. But it's not an un, it's not an unfamiliar problem. No. It's, yeah. You know, as as I listen to this conversation, and uh, sort of a, somewhat as an outsider, I want to bring us back to the charter. Okay, and I think that until you've answered Robbie's question, I don't know what we're doing here at all. Are we trying to get these populations in to discuss what we're already discussing about the charter, or is there a thought here that we're going to change this charter to affect change in the um, in these communities being part of the political process in this city? I'm not really sure what we're trying to achieve at this moment in time, and I feel like we're just floating away from the charter right now. So if you could bring me back to the charter and tell me what exactly we're trying to do in terms of the charter with this entire discussion, because I can see this discussion going on. I mean, this is, this is the, you know, the $63,000 question. How do you in, in, in engage communities that are so busy just trying to survive that they really don't have time to be involved in these in these kinds of discussions and these and and in municipal governance generally and so what is the point of what we're talking about here and how does it relate to the charter that's my question well immigrant communities for example i mean i will follow up so we don't have to talk about this all night but um but when specifically what was raised was can immigrant undocumented workers uh, undocumented people um vote municipal elections that's what they were asking me about. And they said that they'd had discussions with some people who were elected officials in the city. Mm -hmm. they, and uh, they felt that that uh, they expected others to carry this fight. So, you know, the, you know that, I wouldn't have thought of that had they not mentioned it no, to no, me. No, I understand, so. but, the, but the, the agenda item tonight was how do, and I don't have the agenda in front of me, it wasn't about undocumented voting. It wasn't about anything right. concrete dealing with the charter. It was just generally how do we bring 
um, underrepresented communities into this process. What exactly are we trying to achieve here in terms of the charter? Not in terms of benefiting our, our community, because there's a lot we need to do about that, but we're talking about what do we write into the charter? And again, I don't think we know that until we talk to those communities, though. I mean, but I don't think we're going to solve that tonight. I think what, you know. I don't think we're going to solve that at right? all. Yes. Yeah. Maybe in not. Charter, maybe not. my point. I just don't know where we're going with this. We, we I, I understand that if you want to have topics like election issues and you want to go to underrepresented communities to say, we're thinking about undocumented people voting in elections, we'd like to hear from you on this. Mm -hmm. But that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is just sort of this ethereal desire to bring underrepresented people into municipal government, but I'm not sure what how that relates to the charter. That's your, your mission here, is the charter. And are you thinking about adding language to the charter that will somehow promote underrepresented people being part of being more engaged I, in government? Yeah, I actually think what I'm, what we talk, I mean, you, yes, I think that what I've been, what was stimulated by thinking was this conversation. It's very late in the game. We don't have a lot of time to do this. I'm not sure it's going to happen. But I think that there are questions that could be raised by, about access to democracy that, and equity that we don't know about. I just don't think I know. Alan, we are a decision making body. And the no question, but we're making, we're here making decisions. We are affecting, we have influence. This is what the charter is. We are effectively creating at a structural level this document, this living document that will be able to make decisions, make choices, et cetera. This is, it's about power, essentially. We are a body of power. We, you're not going to be able to just sort of deny that. I don't think you, I think you're you're a, a, a body that was appointed to make recommendations to the body with power. Mm -hmm. So we have power in that capacity. Okay, so all I'm asking, Molly, is explain to me what it is your thinking would go into the charter that. Uh, I mean, Ellen, I again, there are no there are no quick fixes to this. There's literally, this is literally a very predictable part of the process where people hear this and get very frustrated and this, it doesn't sound concrete enough for folks and they want it to relate back and they're getting anxious about the timing, et cetera, et cetera, and they want a solution and they want it to be very concrete. We are making, we are essentially talking about things that are affecting people who are not at the table. So I think part of the discussion around how do we serve underrepresented, you know, how do we incorporate underrepresented communities is because we are having conversations that affect underrepresented communities and they should be part of those conversations. So at the very least, it should be about how to get people involved in the conversations that are happening like the ones tonight, right? And the way that we do that is through this in some ways, and sometimes it sounds very theoretical. We get on the same page with concepts, et cetera. We think about the data. We try to understand the population we are serving. It is not a short process. This is what it looks like to engage people. But the charter review process is a very short process. I, I understand that. Look, Stan came to me because he knew I was interested in this topic, and this group was interested in it being more equitable and in, 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 in being more inclusive. And now I feel like all of you are looking at me to have, again, those sort of like, well, make equity inclusion just be faster. No, I'm not asking you to I think I'm not saying that. I, I, I have never suggested that. Well, I'm that's partly, I think you have to take, there's some accountability here because there's some level of like, make this relate back to the charter and make this, you know, like, You're it does relate to the charter. And I'm asking you how. Tell me how, what are you intending to put in the charter that will effectuate the bringing of underrepresented um, communities into municipal government? Uh, we're having a theoretical discussion. Every other discussion we've had has been around a specific concept. We, you know, 16-year-old vote. I, I'm just trying to bring us back to the charter. I understand. Okay. Sam? Well, I, I think... I, I think that this has gone off base a lot, but I, I think we are a charter review committee. I would like to know 
some type of goal is our goal to do outreach to communities is our goal to change language is it both and i am concerned about having goals at least partially identified because again we do have a timeline i can't be coming up with those answers i mean that's for this committee and the the folks that decided but that's the point right is that and you need to decide this committee needs to decide whether it's comfortable making those decisions without those represented communities here in some way influencing that decision so maybe the goal is you know talk to people by x i mean i don't know it's not i i'm just sharing um some best practices and i think it's on this group to sort of decide how we want to implement that and what the goal is for our work i'm sorry alan do you see it differently did you see mm -hmm. me as sort well, of I'm not, I'm not talking to you at all I'm, i was asking generally the committee what exactly are we talking about? And what does this have to do specifically? I'm, I mean, I, I only address you because you were uh, addressing this issue, but my, my question was to the committee, what does this exactly have to do with the charter? Okay. And again, Robbie's question was, was a good one. Are we just trying to get these underrepresented populations out to have their, their input into what we're already talking about, or are we trying to actually change language in the charter that will institutionalize the inclusion of these communities into our municipal government? Because if it's the latter, I think you have bitten off something way larger than you're ever going to be able to chew between now and December 31st when your d report has to be in. Okay, thanks, Alan. Bill. I would <clears throat> recommend that actually we do, uh, actually what was originally proposed was uh, establishing a subcommittee to, uh, f you know, to at least attempt outreach and, and try to identify points of outreach and contact and possibly the best way to proceed. Uh, and that that uh, committee in turn makes recommendations to the committee at large and see if we can incorporate those in the time that we have remaining to see. Uh, how we can expand inclusion in the discussion for input. I mean, th truth be told, there's, given the amount of people who show up for these things, there's 29,252 people who have not come and spoke, who are not participating and, and, and engaged. But the fact is, is that they are comfortably empowered. Many of them feel comfortably empowered and not worried. So I think to Molly's concern and point that if we can at least at the very least do outreach and see if we can get some sense a foothold or at least a, a starting point and i think part of the frustration you're experiencing is where's the starting point it's 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 amorphous at this point and so one of the things that you described is when when there's nothing concrete everyone gets frustrated and 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 that's true but i think a concrete step would be doing outreach and establishing best yeah. outreach avenues and then that would be something that would be an action that hopefully would translate and have benefits or at least in some way have some some influence that doesn't currently exist for a long long term benefit well then the, on this beyond this exactly and I, in in that's right i meant to say that the fact is is that beyond the uh this committee's best intentions and this committee's charge, because this comes up like Haley's Comet every 10 years, right? I think there's a possibility of, of something that outreach starts hopefully an engagement that actually can expand uh, into the broader discussion about policy. When we do talk about things on council floor, when we do talk about elections separate from the charter, but as, as we as we try to struggle with this through as a city or as, as community members that we start to see a greater influence on uh, from underrepresented groups okay so the aspirations laudable and it's good and it's right and it's proper the the efficacious way to do it in the context of this is not perhaps the best but the outreach is critical yeah I absolutely agree so I, I'm up for a subcommittee and Thank Bob, you, Bob's got his hand up. Yes, Bob. I think to abstract, this, this committee has busied itself at the intersection of executive authority and legislative intent. And I reflect back on what Councillor Klein said to us early on, and many of the, many of the concerns she brought up 
had to deal with underrepresented communities. And she offered some solutions as to ways to enhance communication, ways to enhance involvement, staff positions that might be helpful to the council in reaching out and hearing people, et cetera. Um, to what the solicitor is saying, if it is our judgment or the subcommittee's recommendation, if there's a, a subcommittee, based on work that has already been done, that the charter acts in such a way to make difficult or prevent a legislative intent which says this city should operate in such a way as to hear its underrepresented um, you know, populations, then perhaps we can fashion something to remove that or encourage that. Whether it is an ombudsman, whether it is some sort of, some sort of functionary that in the long run can bring people to the table. But other, other than that, I don't see how we can grapple with the enormity of this, of this situation. Okay, um, I, I, I really, I don't have an answer to Robbie's question, and I, I don't think I'll have an answer to it from my perspective until I, I hear from those voices that we, we, we're not hearing from. I think that we need to get more people at the table, and we may be surprised at what we hear. There may be some ideas that, that haven't occurred to us that we can act on as the Charter Review Committee. Um, I, I, I don't know yet, but until we hear from those voices, I'm not willing to say that this is too enormous a problem for us to tackle. So I, uh, I appreciate Bill's suggestion that we form a subcommittee. I would suggest uh, that we uh, name Bill, Patty, and Molly to that subcommittee. Careful what you say, right? <laughs> it was so, my suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm down. Is there a, a, a motion to approve the formation of a, a subcommittee on reaching out to underrepresented communities? So moved. Second. I have to discuss it with my therapist. But. Uh, <laughs> whose members are Molly, Patty, and Bill? Second. Sam. Second. Is there a second? second. Yep, Sam second. Any, any further discussion? Anyone else want to join that subcommittee? Okay. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Approved unanimously. So we will we will get the report of the of, from the mayor's office. We will have that in the next few days. The subcommittee will proceed as it as it wants to and we will we will make this the focus of our July 20 uh, July 18th meeting that is just an open meeting law issue it's just a uh, clarifications if any one of us talks to another one of us outside of a public meeting about this issue we're in violation of open meeting law absolutely so just to be clear so if I were to talk to you Molly and then, so when we when we email or contact each other we should um, it's only about organization for me, not meetings. deliberating and debating any issues that we couldn't speak about in public. Mm -hmm. That's what happens when you get a committee this small. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's weird. A quorum is any two of us. Yeah. And that also includes uh, chain emails. For instance, you send an email to me that I in turn send to Patty and stuff. No, so. no, no. You send an email to each other, you violate that's right. it. Well, that's right, we we're already violated. What am I saying? Yeah. So About nothing substantive between any of any two of you. That's Just relevant to here's the agenda, time, place, mm -hmm. meeting. Here are documents we're gonna be talking about. That's it. Is it okay? Okay. Yeah. Uh thanks. Uh, it, this is very important and I, I appreciate the the time that we've spent on it and the time we will spend on it. Or just a reminder that we are only meeting once in July, July 18th, and once in August, August 20th. So we're not having the customary meetings on the first Tuesday of July or August. And I find out I can't be here in July, so. Yes, we so we August won't see you for two months, Robbie. Just to clarify, July 16th, right? Uh, so Tuesday? Yeah. Yeah, July okay. 18th is a Thursday. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. 
July 16th. I'm sorry. Our next meeting is July 16th. Uh, may I move that we adjourn? Yes, you may. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you.